Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. I, uh, you, you don't know how lucky you are. This is, this is going to be the most interesting program that we have probably all year. And it's probably a program that touches us more fundamentally than anything that we'll talk about. Because we're going to talk about a foundation of, uh, you know, the, the sense of fairness and trust in American society. And it's grounded in institutions we don't talk about, in our judiciary. And uh, we're so fortunate to have this remarkable group of colleagues who are here today. And I, so I, I can't tell you how lucky you are, and I'm glad you're here, you're, and how much I'm looking forward to having you and having hearing from them. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS. And, uh, when we have public events, we always start with a little safety announcement. And so uh, Suzanne and I, we're responsible for everybody's well-being. If we hear somebody say, evacuate, please follow our instructions. We're going to go through this door here or this. And so they'll both take us back. Right behind this door is the stairs that take us down to the to the ground level. We're going to take two left-hand turns and a right-hand turn. We're going to go over to National Geographic, and I'm going to pay for everybody's ticket to see the Queens of Egypt show. It's a great show. It's really fun. And uh, uh, But seriously, if uh, we do take seriously, we're responsible for you, and I hope that you'd just be, be patient and work with us if we have to do something. I don't think we'll have to. We haven't had to in five years. Um, for a combination of reasons, I've spent a lot of time reflecting over the last two months. I have a kind of a complicated illness that kept me in the hospital for 31 days. You know, you, you lay in the bed and look at ceiling tiles of, uh, in a hospital, and, you know, you got a lot of time to think. Um, and I came to realize what a remarkably precious thing it is to live in a society where rule of law is the norm. We don't think about this. We don't talk about it enough. We don't really pull it into our hearts to what it means. And we don't think about how vulnerable we are if somebody can threaten it and challenge it. We're going to get into that today. Uh, I'm very grateful that Suzanne Spaulding has brought, Harvey, you're right up front here. Just come on over and stop, stop talking to the beautiful women in the back, okay? Um, we're, we are, um, we're going to explore this. Uh, Suzanne has been with us for the last, she's going to really frame this, but she's, uh, she's been looking for the last year at what we have seen happen in Europe where uh, hostile intelligence services have intentionally targeted the judiciary to undermine its credibility in those societies. And we're seeing signs of it here. Uh, you know, think of how vulnerable we might be if we started to fundamentally question the fairness uh, and the decency of our judicial system. It is, this is probably the greatest risk I can think of right now, and I want to thank Suzanne for bringing it to my attention and helping all of us think it through. So Suzanne, come up here. You're going to really get this started for real. I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to our remarkable speakers today. This is going to be a very rich afternoon. Thank you very much. Come, Suzanne. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hamry, for setting the scene so beautifully and for your strong support for this effort uh, from the very, very beginning. Uh, when I got out of DHS and started thinking about this, the first call I made was to, uh, to John Hamry, and he said, just tell me how, what I can do to help. And he's been the, the strongest supporter ever since. And it's very appropriate in your remarks, uh, again, set the tone perfectly that we are doing this, of course, on Law Day. That is not uh, by happenstance. Uh, we thought it was an appropriate day to, to, to emphasize this. And um, I want to thank also uh, Democracy Fund and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation for their support, for the work that is reflected in the report that we issued today, uh, and their ongoing support from the Democracy Fund. Thank you very much. 
Um, I also want to thank two of our most important senior advisors on this project, and that is Harvey Rishikoff, uh, the chair of the advisory committee of the ABA's Standing Committee on Law and National Security, which has been a terrific partner, and Elizabeth Rinskoff Parker, who was my boss at, when she was the general counsel at CIA back in the early 90s. Uh, and, and has gone on to do many illustrious things and most recently, uh, and still I guess is Dean Emeritus of the McGeorge School of Law at the University of the Pacific in California and recently stepped down as head of the California Bar Association. And Harvey and Elizabeth will be moderating our panels um, today. So thank you to them for their ongoing uh, insight, guidance, help, uh, and, and today. And then I really want to thank my co-authors on this report. Uh, Davey Nair, who is our uh, program manager and research associate and a beautiful writer. Uh, and Arthur Nelson, uh, who was our researcher and as of today, I think Arthur, is, uh, is the program coordinator and research assistant for the technology program here at CSIS. So working with Jim Lewis and Will Carter and those uh, brilliant folks here at CSIS working on those technology issues. And, and Arthur really did the computational analysis for us, poured over 11 million tweets uh, with some help from some technology uh, to produce so much much of what is reflected in this report and to help us really get more granular in, in, uh, in looking at this. And so I'm going to give you a brief summary of some of the key findings, but I encourage all of you to either pick up a copy or go online and, and read the report. There's a lot more in there than obviously I can present today. Um, and I want, as I go through this, I want you to keep a few key points in mind. So we focus in our report on, act, on Russia's activities to undermine democracy. And we do that because Russia is the only adversary that we see right now that is really engaged in a broad-based concerted campaign to undermine our democratic institutions. It does not mean Russia is the only country that is engaged in influence operations or disinformation uh, tar inside the United States or elsewhere around the world. Um, and it doesn't mean that there aren't other countries that wouldn't have an, a similar interest in undermining the appeal of democracy and that don't have a similar interest in undermining the appeal of democracy and even our institutions of justice. Um, so those are important points to keep in mind. Putin exploits weaknesses and divisions of our own making. Increasingly, they are amplifying domestic voices, right? Russia did not invent these divisions and these weaknesses, but Putin exploits and exacerbates them. It's important you know, to remember that in our system, criticism of our institutions is appropriate and is a way in which we hold them accountable. It makes us better, it makes us stronger, right? And it is done with that intention in mind. All of my wonderful friends who are judicial reform advocates are are out there uh, holding these institutions accountable to make them better and to make us stronger. That is not Putin's objective. Russia is not trying to make us better and stronger. Putin's goal is to weaken us. In the words of his strategic military general, Gerasimov, the objective is to destroy the internal coherence of the enemy. They are trying to get us to give up on our institutions of democracy, and I think their goal can be summed up in the hashtag that they so vigorously pushed in the midterm elections, hashtag walk away. It is this campaign to undermine democracy, and particularly the activities that work to undermine our trust in our justice system that are the focus of the report that we're releasing today. So I'm going to give you a quick run through, then we're going to have a panel that's going to discuss uh, the nature of the threat, and Harvey Rishikoff will moderate that, followed by a panel that will delve into the ways in which we can most effectively counter this threat. And that uh, will be moderated by Elizabeth Rinskoff Parker. And then we are very fortunate to have, uh, to wrap this all up for us and send us all out inspired and ready to act, uh, uh, Michael Chertoff, who will be our closing keynote speaker. So, let's see if this works. 
So the story really sort of starts, uh, this grew out of my work when I was the undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security, responsible for cybersecurity and critical infrastructure protection. And so we had the responsibility for understanding and working with state and local election officials as well as some federal uh, partners to try to protect our election infrastructure in the run-up to the election in 2016. And this is what we saw, we saw uh, cyber incidents targeting voter registration databases, we saw the hack and leak of emails, and we saw the online propaganda efforts. It did not take us long to assess that the cyber incidents in the voter registration databases were part of what the hack and leak of emails and the online propaganda were part of, which is an overarching information operation because the real value in accessing these databases all across the country would have been to disrupt activities on election day. If you delete names, if you uh, change spellings of names, et cetera, and cause disruptions on election day, you could begin to undermine the public's confidence in the legitimacy of the outcome. So we knew we were looking at information operations. We also knew that it was not just about elections, that in fact Russia had this long-term goal, that the, that the interference in the elections was really part of a broader campaign to undermine democracy. And this is the quote from the January intelligence report uh, to that effect. And was confirmed more recently in the criminal complaint uh, that was filed last fall against the group that was most active in the online activities. Uh, that, as you see here, their strategic goal, which continues to this day, was undermining faith in our democratic institutions. So as I thought about this broader campaign when I got out and had the luxury to think bigger, uh, I thought, okay, let's red team this. If, if I were Putin and my goal was to undermine democracy and undermine democratic institutions, where would I go next? What other institution is as dependent as elections on public faith and confidence in the credibility of its outcome to have any meaning? And I immediately thought about the courts in our justice system. Uh, it is dependent on the trust of the public. It is like, as is the media, like the media, it is we look to our courts to help us discern the truth, to figure out what is the fact, right? What are facts? So if you were, as Michael Hayden says, that Putin is, striving for a post-truth world, right? Trying to undermine the public's sense that they have any hope of discerning the truth, which is where we think Russia's population is, right? They shrug their shoulders. They give up on the idea of finding truth. Justice system is a perfect place to target your efforts. And finally, as Heather Conley has shown in her outstanding work that Dr. Hamry referred to on what we've seen uh, Russia doing in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the justice system they have learned can be a place that uncovers their corrupt activities. And so again, a good reason to undermine the credibility of that justice system. So as we began to look, one of the first things we saw was a case in Berlin, Germany. This is January 2016, and some of you will remember this. It was a young girl named Lisa. She was of Russian heritage, living in Germany. She claimed she'd been abducted and raped by migrants. She pretty quickly, in a questioning from the authorities, admitted that that was a lie. She'd made that up because she'd spent the night with a friend and was afraid to tell her parents. But social media grabbed hold of this and started pushing this story and why weren't German prosecutors, why weren't the authorities going after these migrants for this horrible rape of this 16-year-old girl. It was picked up by uh, Russian TV, uh, originally one, and then pushed out to 10 different outlets who pushed this story relentlessly, online, on TV, and ultimately Russian officials, including Foreign Minister Lavrov, who accused officials of sweeping this under the rug. Right? Um, ultimately, they were able to turn out uh, over a thousand people in the streets all across Germany protesting the officials' failure to prosecute a non-existent crime. That story illustrates the three different propaganda channels that Russia uses to push this narrative undermining public trust in the justice system. 
uh, official statements from Russian officials, including Putin himself, and we'll get into that, uh, social media, and state-sponsored Russian uh, outlets and propaganda. And what our research has shown us is that they really are pushing four key frames, all of which go to undermine the belief in the independence and impartiality of the courts. And almost everything we find can fit into one of these narrative frames, which helps people sort of grab hold of this and really makes it real for them, right? So that, 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 that again, lots of uh, this around immigration, which is already a divisive issue, but that the justice system is tolerating this, is covering this up, right? That the justice system is institutionally racist and corrupt, part of the police state, right? That the justice system directly supports and enables corrupt corporations. And one of their favorites, that the justice system is a tool of the political elite and is really just uh, not independent of the politicians and, and the political elite. So we'll walk through some examples. Uh, the state-sponsored media outlet, America's Lawyer, has a weekly program called, uh, RT, Russia Today, has a weekly program called America's Lawyer. It's hosted by a Pensacola trial attorney. The picture is a, an ad, some of you may have seen, that ran, was up on bus stations in Washington, D.C last year, and, and it's, it says, is this American enough for you? Uh, and this is their unrelenting theme. To say that the justice system is broken would be a gross understatement. Cor corporations and corrupt politicians have taken control, turning the once impartial judiciary into a tool for the elite to use for their own gain. Similar narrative is on Sputnik's program, weekly program, Criminal Injustice, um, where they say they, each week, they, the hosts will, quote, discuss the most egregious conduct of our courts and prosecutors and how justice is denied to so many people in our country. Their direct reach is not particularly impressive, but they are picked up by all kinds of outlets, including lots of outlets here in the United States, domestic voices that then retweet, repackage, and, and push them out uh, much more broadly. Social media is where we have seen a, a great deal of activity, and uh, I talked about what happened in the Lisa case in Germany. If you fast forward six months, that was January 2016. Now we're in the summer of 2016 in Twin Falls, Idaho where social media is running a story that a five-year-old girl was raped by Syrian refugees at knife point who were later high-fiving with their dads. The authorities were slow to come out and correct the record because they were juveniles involved, but when they did, they made it very clear. There were no Syrian refugees, there, were no, there was no knife point, there was very likely no rape, there was no high-fiving of the dads. The uh, young people that were involved were, take, uh, were working their way through the system, um, but again, as in Germany, social media would not let go of this, and uh, so we see some of our friends from the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, uh, Russia, who are creating false personas in authentic accounts and weighing in on this controversy. Uh, federal prosecutor Wendy Olson had cautioned people to not keep perpetuating and redistributing and passing on false information that the authorities had already said was false, so of course they went after and attacked her as well. They even tried to organize a rally. This is secured borders. Uh, citizens before refugees trying to get people out onto the streets and they are, are they, their notice for this rally says all government officials who are covering up for these criminals should be fired. U.S. Attorney Wendy Olson should be fired. Uh, Secured Borders was not a group of concerned uh, citizens from Twin Falls, Idaho, but a fake group again um, brought to us courtesy of the Internet Research Agency. Yeah, in St. Petersburg, Mas uh, Ma uh, Russia. We've seen this in other cases where, uh, particularly again in the immigrant context, Kate Steinle was the young woman who was tragically shot on the pier in San Francisco, near Embarcadero. The jury found ultimately that it was a, uh, an accident. It was an uh, undocumented immigrant who had been charged with her shooting. And so, of course, social media uh, erupted. These are, these are show spikes in right-leaning Russian uh, bots and social media accounts um, that are taking advantage 
opportunistically of controversies like this one to weigh in uh, with, with uh, messages that are uh, documenting this as a failure of the justice system. We saw it again in the Molly Tibbetts case, uh, it, the young woman who was murdered in Iowa when an undocumented immigrant was picked up for her murder. Um, so these are examples of the tweets. Kate Steinle verdict is a failure of the justice system, just like it was a failure before when cops who murdered black people get acquitted. Justice system is broken. So this leads to the next frame, which is, again, one that Russia has pushed for many decades, which is you know, that America is a racist country. Uh, and so they are weighing in, and here was it, an, again an example where they took advantage of a controversial situation. Alton Sterling was a black man who was shot and killed by police in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And within 24 hours, the left trolls from Russia were amplifying this uh, ash, hashtag uh, Alton Sterling, um, that's not how justice should work, going after the justice system, lots of tweets along those lines. Of course, it, it's not as good if you don't have some uh, heat on the other side as well. We see them weigh in on both sides of these issues to incite. And so here they are, Heart of Texas is another a gift to us from the Internet Research Agency, uh, trying again to turn people out for a rally. Uh, this is in the wake of Mika Johnson, a few days after Alton Sterling shooting, shooting five Dallas police officers. So again, picking up uh, on, on legitimate controversial issues to incite. This is a graphic that was done by the University of Washington, mapping Twitter conversations around Black Lives Matter. The orange is uh, uh, are accounts that have been linked to Russia, and it shows their centrality in both sides. This is left-leaning and right-leaning um, trolls. Uh, so again, stoking flames of division. Um, we have a report that you can find on our website about why we think Putin specifically targets minorities and affinity groups. Um, it's very pernicious. Their work on social media really pulls uh, the folks that, that read this into a virtual vortex. So when you click, uh, because of the way these platforms work, when you click on something to read it, you've, you've, you've bought into the teaser, right? Uh, the algorithms note that this is something you're interested in, and, and so they send you more of that. And the more you click, the more they send you, and the more it reinforces uh, the vortex that they're trying to pull you down. The other uh, narrative is the, is the uh, justice system is really just a tool of the political elite. This feeds into this deep state narrative, and Putin is really pushing the idea of the surveillance state. So this was ironically in response to a question from, John, from uh, Edward Snowden uh, about does Russia have a mass surveillance program? And um, Putin says, oh, thank God ours at least is strictly controlled by the law, regulated by the law, and the clear implication reinforced by a lot of their messaging is that ours is not. Um, this is, this is the uh, 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 broad Twitter activity around hashtag release the memo. You'll remember this is the memo in the House of uh, Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence around the Carter Page FISA uh, application and, and that investigation. Um, and Russia weighed in really down at the left side of this uh, chart um, to add accelerant to really push that, boost that line up. And a big part of what happens on social media is that they're trying to create the appearance um, that this has widespread uh, acceptance and pickup and to push hashtags particularly into trending hashtags so that more people will see them and pay attention to them. Uh, we've seen them go after Mueller as part of this deep state narrative. And so in that criminal complaint in September, we saw um, quoted instructions from the leadership at the Internet Research Agency to their trolls, uh, specifically telling them to go after Mueller as a puppet of the establishment, uh, that he represents the establishment, that there will be no honest and open results from the investigation. And then, of course, we saw Putin's, uh, we've seen Putin's remarks over the last uh, couple of weeks about the Mueller report, again, undermining uh, its credibility. And this was one of the first Putin quotes that I came across when I started really digging into this area. 
uh, that really convinced me that this was not just collateral damage, this was not just you know, kind of one-offs, but that in fact Putin is irritated by the uh, s reputation of our justice system and our system uh, ab abiding by the rule of law, uh, and it really wants to undermine that. Uh, and so we see his comment here when we see additional diplomatic facilities where he said, I'm going to ask my folks to sue in U.S. courts, and then we'll see how effective this much lauded American justice system is. Um, Putin's audiences are his own population first and foremost. Don't long for Western style democracy. It's not all it's cracked up to be. Our population, right, give up on your democracy, and populations around the world where we compete for influence. This continues to this day. This is Christopher Wray, the uh, current director of the FBI, pointing out that it is designed, that, that, that Russia's efforts are designed to undermine America's faith in democracy. It's not just election, it's 365 days a year. There will be attacks on, and are attacks on other institutions. We have focused on the justice system for the reasons I've explained, and there uh, are and will continue to be attacks by other state actors, but these attacks by Russia are particularly pernicious at this point in time. When we are asking our courts to step in to prevent constitutional crisis and clashes between the Congress and the President, if there is an environment that has been created such that a significant segment of the, pop, of the public does not accept the credibility of the decisions of those courts, we are in big trouble. And democracy is in big trouble. We started this with a group of uh, bipartisan national security efforts, produced a report in February of last year looking at broadly at adversary attacks on democratic institutions. Uh, Secretary Chertoff was a part of that uh, group and we produced a report and made five key recommendations which are here and which are reproduced in our report um, and apply across the board. But as we delve into the justice system, we realize there are some specific recommendations that apply in this context. We need to raise the awareness uh, and invest in understanding better the impact so that we can target our efforts at those that have the greatest impact. We need to improve rapid response capabilities. We need to move quickly when we, we need to detect and respond to these disinformation capabilities, and we're working on that. Um, improve communication capabilities between the justice system and other federal entities and social media platforms with the courts. And importantly, and you'll he hear about this on our second panel, improve civics education. These efforts are really focused on transparency. And that is really a critical component. I believe Russia is exercising jujitsu here. They are trying to use our strength against us. Our strength in terms of our freedom of speech, our open marketplace of ideas, our robust debate and discussion in this country. And they are trying to use that against us and they are trying to get us to unilaterally cut back our own selves on what is our greatest strength and get us to fight on their ground. We need to use that strength to, to fight them, right? We need to regain that strength and that upper hand and fight on our grounds, which means that we need to put an emphasis on transparency. We need to put an emphasis on things like uh, identify, label, and overwhelm disinformation, ranging from innovative initiatives of social media platforms to the use of legal tools like the Foreign Agent Registration Act, strengthen campaign finance and advertising laws, use online tools and targeted messaging um, to teach media literacy and our shared values. The world is becoming more transparent every single day. We have, the, we have the advantage. We are used to dealing in a transparent world. Our key adversaries, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, they're terrified of transparency. We need to remember that is our strength and fight from our uh, position of strength. We need to train to fight in the light. If you train to fight in the dark, you could meet your enemy at night or turn off the light and have the advantage. If we train to fight in the light and a transparent world is coming and we can turn on the lights, we have the advantage. Thank you very much. I'll turn this over now to our first panel. Harvey.
who I've known for many, many years. And I just want to know th the support you've given. It's great to have you back involved with us. And thank you for supporting this effort, which is so important. But CIS would not be what it is without you, John. And let's recognize that again, OK? Thank you. Um, OK, so let's, um, I think, get to the issues here. I think I will briefly introduce the panelists, but you have the the program which lays it out. I've known Seth for a number of years. It's hard to think of someone who would be better to lay out this issue. Uh, he's now with CSIS. He has both a counterterrorism, counterinsurgency background, but I think we'll be looking forward for you to help set the table. Um, Sanjit, uh, it's great to have you here uh, from my own home from the Department of Justice. Uh, you've been involved in these issues for a while. I think you've helped write a number of reports. Uh, for the department that I think have been quite significant and I think getting your input will be quite important for the audience. And finally we have uh, my old friend Laura Flint who's been involved with the governance program in democracy and more significantly when you read her background she also worked for one of the great legends uh, in the Senate, uh, Patrick Leahy, who I think has been a real friend in a variety of these issues on many, 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 many points. So with that, uh, Seth, can you like sort of help set the table. Many of us are old Russian hands. And um, this is a historic context about this disinformation is not new to the Russians. Can you give us a yeah. sense of how you say this in the context? Yeah, and I should note, uh, I've spent on and off the last five years looking at uh, the history of Russian intelligence, uh, including disinformation, forgery campaigns, uh, since the Cold War, so that's what this is This is based on. A look at mostly Service A and the KGB and other organizations like that. I think what's, what strikes me as I uh, listened to Suzanne speak earlier and as I uh, read through the report, uh, obviously as I paid attention to what we've seen over the last few days and months and even years on Russian activity, is how similar in many ways at least the playbook is to what Russian uh, operations have included over the last several decades. So where I wanted to start is, uh, and there's some differences that I'll highlight, but where I wanted to start is the broader historical uh, strategy uh, from the Russians of active measures. And active measures, for those of you who don't remember uh, what, what existed during the Cold War, included in many ways what Suzanne noted about Russian activity today. It was the focus was primarily on um, steps that I'll outline in a moment that benefited Moscow, not just at home, but particularly overseas in what they viewed as a competitive environment, and steps that undermined the U.S. Uh, directly, including domestically, um, U.S. operations, foreign policy, economic interests overseas, and then undermined U.S. alliances and relationships with its partners overseas. So really targeted on uh, multiple, mul multiple objectives. What active measures particularly focused on during the Cold War, we know, and both the, uh, either the declassification or in the, in the case of the Matrokin archives, the stolen uh, information from KGB archives and declassified US archives gives us a pretty good picture of active measures. They included a couple of things which sound a lot like what we see today. They include things like uh, pretty, aggressive disinformation campaigns, ones that really were directed towards undermining the United States overseas and faith in U.S. institutions. And, and if people don't remember some of the more successful disinformation campaigns that the Russians ran during the Cold War, probably the most successful one, certainly one of the most successful ones, was the AIDS campaign, where they planted a story in an Indian newspaper, the Express, uh, then had Russian uh, uh, newspapers and Russian, um, various Russian programs in Eastern Europe pick it up that AIDS uh, originated from the, um, from the uh, uh, U.S. laboratory, military laboratory at Fort Detrick, Maryland. And so what you had was something that was <coughs> entirely fictitious, spread on multiple forums and by, interestingly, by the late 1980s, what, what uh, even U.S. medical journals uh, conducting polling in both the United States and overseas, particularly African countries, stunningly found was that this myth, which originated from a Soviet disinformation campaign, 
had influenced the, the, the views of, in some of the countries, polled uh, a third of the population believed that the US, either the intelligence community or the military, had manufactured AIDS in laboratories, and that was the origin. I mean, it was an incredibly successful case. What makes active, this is what we call active measures, I think just as true in what Suzanne outlined earlier, is if done effectively, it can take on a life of its own. So it's not just uh, a function of intelligence services uh, projecting information out. If it's done well, it starts to get picked up and takes on a life of its own in the media or in other forums like that. That's why I call it active measures, uh, because there is a, there's, there's an action component of it even outside of Russian intelligence hands. Uh, there were plenty of other examples of this. We saw forgeries. Uh, throughout the Cold War, we saw uh, ac uh, agents of influence, the recruitment of journalists or academics to write papers that supported uh, Russian and, and Soviet interests, the use of front groups, a whole range of activities that uh, have, have uh, sound a lot like what Suzanne outlined earlier. Obviously, some differences as we move into the, the uh, uh, present the, the ideology of, this, of, of the Soviet Union, what was Marxism, Leninism, has evolved. Uh, we don't see that ideology anymore, but what we do see is a, a sort of this vociferous anger that where the Soviet Union, uh, what happened to it and its downgrading uh, is something that uh, Putin uh, wants back. The, the uh, role of social media is clearly new in what you laid out, that we have not really seen historically. Probably the level of polarization in the US other than maybe Vietnam, uh, has allowed them to exploit political differences. So let me just conclude by highlighting one of the things that has struck me about Russian operations today is how, at least to a, a, um, a strategic de uh, degree, the Russians have um, paid close attention to the, the, the literature and psychology. The, the active measures campaigns, including the one Suzanne uh, outlined are high volume and multi-channel. That's designed in part uh, because they recognize in psychology that a variety of sources can influence someone's perception of what is real and what is not. It's rapid, it's continuous, and it's repetitive from, again, from multiple channels to influence its audience. It's lack of commitment to objective reality, and it's lack of commitment to consistency becomes important when we have an airliner down in Ukraine and they're tied, weapon systems and Russian-backed rebels are tied to the downing of the airline. What they want in something, in a case like that, is confusion about the causes so it doesn't get tied to Russia. So I, I would just say more broadly, there are some interesting historical parallels to what we're seeing today. I, I would say they've done their homework in many ways on the psychology of influence in looking at what, what uh, psychology tells us works and doesn't work. And with that, I will turn it back. Perfect, thank you, Seth. I remember once being with a negotiation with a Russian delegation on some issue, and the old Russian looked at me and said, what you have to understand is the true battleground is the six inches between your ears. <laughs> and if we can control that space, you win. then we are winning, right? So you have the lovely uh, obligation and sort of duty of responding on behalf of the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. So you've been involved in that. What, is, what would you say is the current sort of approach that we're taking now to these threats at the Department of Justice? Well, much of it. First of all, thank you for, for having me here today. It's a, a real pleasure to be here to talk about what's a very serious issue. I, I think uh, Director Ray actually stated it best uh, just last Friday when he was at the Council for Foreign Relations, talking about how the Russian uh, active measure campaign is very much in line with what they've been doing for decades. What is different uh, is the, obviously, the cyber-enabled aspect. You know, they're able to reach us from hundreds, if not thousands, of miles away. And that's what makes it particularly pernicious, because if you don't know who your adversary is, if they're acting covertly, if they're putting themselves up as fellow Americans, you don't have a sense of who they are and what they're trying to do. It's a little bit different when it's, you know, Russia Today or Sputnik which actually, as of now, are registered agents under the FARA, so that's an accomplishment. Um, but it's one thing, when they advertise themselves openly and you can make your own determination about, you know, why are the Russians telling me this or that. But when they pose covertly, 
and try to pass themselves off as fellow Americans. That's what's especially pernicious. Um, and so that's something that we're focused on, uh, particularly uh, at the Department of Justice and the FBI, working with our colleagues in the intelligence community, is making sure that we understand where this information is coming from. Again, we're not in the business of, of arbitering uh, what's truth or what's not truth. That is absolutely not the role of the government. What we can do, though, is try to identify the source of the information. If that information is coming from abroad, that is something that the American people should know. Um, and so we've developed policies within the Department of Justice uh, that are neutral, that are objective, that are not uh, based on content, but that are focused on, in the appropriate context, elucidating the source of, of, of foreign information. And certainly, if it violates criminal law, in the appropriate cases, we'll bring indictments. Those indictments will be detailed, and they'll help inform the American public about what our foreign adversaries are, are doing. Now again, this is not uh, purely limited to cyber activity. Uh, I think as Seth mentioned, and certainly as Suzanne mentioned in her speech, um, these measures are across the spectrum of activity. So it involves real agents. It involves uh, economic espionage in the case of certain other countries. It's, you know, the cyber aspect of it is one piece of a much broader puzzle, uh, broader uh, effort to undermine the liberal Western democratic order. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. What I will say is uh, we've been very, very active in trying to build awareness of the problem. Because that's another part of it, is if you don't know what's happening, it's that much easier for foreign adversaries to take advantage. But the more that we shine a light on the activity and make sure that our citizenry is informed about it, uh, they are much less likely to be effective. Thanks. Um, so, Laura, I guess the question is from where you sit. What do you see as sort of the issue that's the most worrisome for you when you think about the attack vector that the, we're experiencing? Yeah, thanks, Harvey, and thanks so much, uh, Suzanne, and to CSIS for, for including me in this remarkable event and for the work that you're doing on this incredibly important issue. And I thought I would actually answer that question by kind of trying to put this in a, a larger framework of why we should care about the attacks on our justice system that have been described. Um, so first, you know, we need a strong justice system and fidelity to the rule of law in the way that Dr. Hamry so eloquently described earlier in order to maintain a healthy democracy. And it sounds simple, but I think it sometimes gets lost in all the fray around these issues. And so at Democracy Fund, we're, we're working to strengthen American democracy here at home and to build resilient democratic institutions. And so we're looking at that across a range of, of institutions, but Recently, with the kinds of attacks that have been described, we've definitely been looking much more closely at the online public square, at election security, and importantly, at the rule of law, including the integrity of our court system and the independence of law enforcement. So we, we know, of course, in this room, that our system of checks and balances protects against abuse of power, um, and that it, we live in a country where the rule of law is paramount, and that means that everyone has to follow the law. You know, I'm sure we all know the John Adams quote, uh, describing a republic as um, a government of laws and not of men. Um, and in part, based on some of the facts that have, were laid out in the Mueller report, I think we need to reckon with the fragility of this system for a whole range of reasons. But I also think it's important to just state that this is also partially in the face of a president whose words and actions have at times suggested that he does not think that the laws apply to him the same as they do to others. Now, I want to get more concrete about the importance of these concepts to maintaining a healthy democratic system overall. Last year, um, Rachel Kleinfeld of the Carnegie Endowment for, in for International Peace, who some of you may know, um, she conducted a comparative study looking at other countries or jurisdictions where democracy had been in decline. And she was looking at a range of little d democratic institutions to assess which were most important for a renewal process, um, kind of trying to look at these comparative examples, in part to provide lessons for the, the US context um, and the kinds of threats that, that have been described. Um, and she concluded that across her case studies, the institutions of justice are a consistent source of resilience and really emphasize the importance of them. In countries that face democratic backsliding, in some of those cases, the executive had co-opted domestic intelligence um, and law enforcement agencies, sometimes to prevent investigations against themselves, sometimes to direct investigation against their enemies. 
In countries where there had been democratic renewal, both the courts and prosecutorial entities, they obviously vary across different countries, played very key roles in either preventing or fixing damage to institutions. So this is not theoretical. We've seen this in other contexts. And the lesson here is that um, it is incredibly important to maintain both legal and political efforts to protect these institutions from manipulation and to make them as strong as they possibly can be. So, so it's both trustworthy and trusted, right? It's both of those things, and those are different. So if you think that the United States is facing, um, in its, its democratic institutions are facing vulnerabilities right now, then maintaining a strong and independent justice system is absolutely crucial, and that, of course, in turn may well explain, uh, as Suzanne said, why um, Russia is making it, um, making it a target. Now, I do want to just touch briefly um, on a second point about uh, the fact that our response has been hampered by polarization. Um, and that means that perhaps the response has not been as strong as it, as it, as it could be, given the threat and given the stakes. Um, Suzanne laid this out, so I will not get into detail. But you know, our, uh, our, our electorate right now is fertile ground for a disinformation campaign. We have become very deeply polarized as a country. And just to state what that means, because I think we often refer to it without explicitly uh, defining it. Um, it is where your party identification largely predicts your worldview and ideological position rather than vice versa. And the two parties are also moving further and further apart in their views. So this is not new, and this is an important point to make. Political scientists have been studying this and tell us that these trends go back 40 years. But it is certainly much more extreme now, and it is exactly why it has been so much easier to exploit these divisions. As Sudan said, sometimes pushing two sides of the same debate um, in the Russian disinformation campaigns. And part of the challenge, of course, is that some, not all, but some of the critiques are perfectly valid and the kinds of things that we actually um, need to be keeping close tabs on. So, you know, bottom line, um, we really have to stop looking at this threat through a partisan lens and thinking about you know, which party benefits. And we've got to treat it as the national security threat that it is and give it the response that it deserves. Stop Great. There. Um, so when I used to work for the Chief Justice, we had the, the Judicial Conference Committee on International Relations. And we used to say that there were only three exports that the world wanted without question. Uh, one was Coca-Cola. Uh, the second were American genes. And the third was American judges. The world was hungry to have the experience of American judges, federal and state. So I think underscoring for us in this room, the role of the judiciary and the role it plays in democracy is almost a given. And we are trying to understand and why it's such a great target. So one of the issues I want to pose to the panel is, this panel is trying to understand the, understand the threat landscape. And part of the threat landscape is ourselves. We have unique First Amendment laws, which make it, as you alluded to, complicated when you want to do particular sort of prosecutions. And part of the channel is social media, which is part of the new element of this particular phase of our interrelations with the Russians. And we have something called Section 230 of the, Common, uh, the Communications Decency Act, which makes the platforms not have an obligation to take down material. And they only take down material on specific issues that have been um, basically carved out, such as uh, child pornography or related drugs. So I'm curious from your perspective, given that landscape that's being exploited, how you approach it, Seth, for understanding that media and what you think the appropriate role is for those new titans inside the space, how you understand it as what's appropriate that you might want to see some legal reform, mm -hmm. and how you understand it as a committed to democracy and free speech, how we deal with this phenomena which is being exploited by our adversaries. Seth. So one, one area that I have been looking at recently is uh, the uh, use of social media platforms, including Facebook, for um, targeting the judiciary, and that is spreading disinformation on platforms, including <coughs> Facebook. Now, having worked a little bit with Facebook recently, um, one of the things I think that has 
pushed many of these social media companies to be a little bit more sensitive about them as being has been being hauled before Congress, and uh, where the, the uh, good good work by um, uh, by newspaper reporters, investigative journalists, and by congressional committees and by other individuals to highlight examples of targeting the judiciary have been brought to Facebook's attention. And ju just to give a sense of, I think, how we're starting to move in this direction, much like in many of us have also spent time in the counterterrorism arena of identifying extremist uh, use of social media platforms, uh, there is now a major growth in some of the platforms, including Facebook, to um, develop their algorithms to identify targeting of judiciary uh, using their platforms and then also to educate because they've reached out to experts to educate their human analysts because they've got Facebook will have both it's, it's algorithms so the, the AI side and then the the human experts uh, with help from outside to better understand the methods being used so we've seen increasingly Facebook take down um, some of these sites, uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen them highlighted from tech firms, too, that have highlighted um, IRIB, so Iranian, uh, use of disinformation along these lines, taken down on social media platforms. I think one of the things that has at least uh, made me feel like we're starting to grapple with the problem is that s some of our social media companies have started to invest resources, techno technological and human into understanding and then taking action quickly. Because I think one of the things that Suzanne highlighted with uh, the Lisa case, for example, or, or others, is the speed of responding is actually quite important. Whether it's taking down or putting something up that, uh, un that undermines the myth, that's quite important. So you know there has been progress. I can't speak for all social media platforms. Uh, looking inside of the Facebook box, though, makes me hopeful that some of these platforms have improved or are improving. So you know um, your boss is testifying this morning, um, and that's what I heard. <laughs> and like all events in Washington, is focused. And Senator Graham, by beginning, said that he acknowledged the fact that one aspect of the Mueller report that is not contested by both sides of the aisle is the clear recognition of Russian attempts to be involved in the election process yeah. and the number of indictments that mm -hmm. flew from that, flowed from that. And he also mentioned the effort to pass legislation across the aisle with White House on deter, that there's both a Republican and Democratic consensus that this is wrong and they have to go forward. So from your perspective as a prosecutor, what, what are you looking for how you distinguish this First Amendment problem versus the indictments that we got out of the Mueller probe. And it took the Mueller probe to get those indictments. And should we expect more of those type of indictments coming out mm -hmm. of Maine Justice? Well, let me put it to you this way. You know, the, if you look at the special counsel indictments, there's basically two theories, right? There's the social media part of it, and then there's the hacking part of it. I can start with the second part first, because those are very clear violations of federal criminal law, right? The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, criminalizes essentially intruding into other people's computer networks without their authorization or consent. So irrespective of who, do, who violates it, right, they are in violation of the law. If you're a Russian actor, if you're an American actor, if you're Russians and Americans who have conspired to create that kind of activity, that's in violation of American law. There's always the uh, principles of prosecution that we go through to decide whether or not to charge somebody, and that's a whole different set of, you know, uh, that's a different conversation. But in terms of hacking, that's a very clear violation of federal law, and I, I don't think that's particularly controversial. The social media side of it is a little more interesting because there are First Amendment issues. Um, with that said, I, I don't think it's particularly controversial to say that foreign actors outside the United States don't enjoy First Amendment rights. It's not clear to me what their First Amendment uh, rights are. Now, there is a First Amendment right for Americans to receive information. So that's where there's a little bit of tension, um, and I think academics have sort of explored that question, and it's a, it's a very interesting one. But uh, certainly the Mueller uh, team, the special counsel team, uh, identified 
uh, essentially efforts by foreign actors to impede American uh, government processes, what we call client conspiracies. So conspiracies to essentially gum up the, the processing of American government. We typically see those charges in tax cases when uh, individuals um, essentially impede the work of the IRS. But that theory can just as legitimately be expanded to the Federal Election Commission, uh, and that's part of what the allegations in the indictment, and one of the indictments was, is that the foreign actors were essentially, through covert and uh, improper means, causing uh, false reporting to the FEC and to other sort of organs of our government that are meant to help our democracy run transparently and openly. So those are novel theories, but at least in my view, those are perfectly credible theories, and those tools are available to us. I'm not gonna comment on any pending legislation or anything that's currently out there now, but I think there are, certainly are areas where we can sharpen some of our tools. Um, part of those questions deal with registration requirements, which we're strengthening and we're trying to um, ensure that there's more transparency in sort of what kind of money is coming into the system and who are the actors are. Uh, and there are other areas that, that we can talk about as we go forward, but as a basic, you know, uh, arsenal. I think we actually have what we need. The question is building our investigative capabilities to make sure that we understand what's going on and then highlighting it and bringing cases as appropriate. Right, and as we know, uh, General Nakasone at uh, Cyber Command mm -hmm. has been taking a much more active response with the Russians. And it's been quite clear that there are active measures that are being done on the covert side, not the overt side. And that's another response that we've taken, and the question is, will that be effective enough, and how we will use both the legal arms, and that you want to jump Yeah, just, just briefly, I mean, there's also, the, there's, there's the legal dimension, there's also, for American companies, there's also violating terms of service. So, uh, by falsely provi uh, uh, providing information on social media platforms, does violate many of these companies' terms of service, and that, that, that can then kick in steps that these companies can take. So. So, so part of the issue is, what happens when you have a Russian troll reinforcing a correct statement that is a appropriate criticism, but is amplifying it? What is your, the democracy, how do you think you, we should respond to those type of problematic situations? So that is a perfect segue into um, what I think is actually the, the first step, which is transparency. And I think there is still a real lack of understanding. I mean, we know a lot more than we did two years ago, three years ago. Um, but we still don't, I mean, there's still so much that we don't know. There's been great work done by some academic researchers. There was a, actually a study of the 2016 election and um, uh, done by um, a researcher at the University of Wisconsin. The Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, of course, brought in some really great technological researchers to look at the data that they had received. Um, the report um, lays out a lot of information about Russian activity, but there's still, because of the nature of social media, and the way in which messages are targeted to individuals, so they may not ever be public, um, it is very hard to, we still don't have a full handle on exactly what's happening, I think, and I think that is really the first place that we need to figure out before we can get to the next steps. Just um, this week, Facebook announced um, that it was taking the next step in a research partnership um, that it's doing uh, to provide um, to a slew of researchers um, much more data. But it's, they've been talking about this for a year. The data is not going to be available still for a few months. It's, it's moved quite slowly. And so I think that the, that is a place where there, there still needs to be additional sure. work. As I look in the audience, uh, there's a lot of gray matter out there and I mean more than just hair color. Um, there's some people who are quite knowledgeable about Russians, and I'm, I'd like to open up to a few questions before I would continue in order to uh, sort of further the conversation. I'm looking at one particular person who has some familiarity with the Russian mode, and I would wonder if you wanna say anything, Professor. Bert, <coughs> Bert and I think he's talking about you. <laughs> Of course. Yeah, there's, a, there's a microphone, Bert. You know, that's what law professors do. You know that, Bert. Yeah. So you should yeah. let Let's everyone say who else you know are. who you are. Yes. Bert Gerber, who's in Georgetown, a retired CIA officer, primarily working against the Soviet Union. 
ironically. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Would you mind standing up and just talking loudly? Thanks. I'm reminded of the many instances in the past when the KGB was particularly engaged in this kind of activity that pretty much got ignored uh, for, by us, not by the intelligence community, which usually identified it and sometimes was able to confirm it, but our political leaders seemed uninterested in it. For instance, I remember well when I was living in Germany in 1960, when there was a massive program of uh, showing swastikas, painting and uh, d uh, putting otherwise up swastikas throughout Bavaria particularly. And the New York Times and others, you know, immediately told us that this was an example of neo-Nazism growing in Germany. And we had a source then who confirmed to us that this was a KGB operation. Um, but it slid away, that kind of thing. There was similar here, just in Prince George's County, back in the 80s, a program in which letters were sent to people uh, about the AIDS crisis uh, that, that you already identified. I think it's important that now, through the media and through the Mueller investigation, we have political leaders recognizing what the problem is. That leaves aside for the moment at least our president who tends to uh, devalue that judgment. But I think otherwise it's pretty strong. And so now it's a question that, that comes, what is the proper response? Now, some of the proper response as Suzanne has outlined and, and her program of, of uh, civic education and, and so forth, because in today's world we don't have enough of that and we also have the, me the, excuse me, the technology of social media misinforming us. But it's important to decide how to confront cyber attacks, although I'm told that we're not supposed to use the word attacks, cyber incidents, and I think General Nakasone, as you said, is now looking at it better than other leaders in that regard. Yeah. I think, yes, thank you, Bert. I think part is our response, but thankfully, um, I'm gonna, our panel will be followed by Elizabeth's panel, which will have all the answers. So we can let them give answers, because we just have to set the landscape of the threat escape. It's, I love the way you set it up, Suzanne, so less pressure on this panel. But I guess one of the things that Bert is raising is that, um, and you raise is that one of the successes and powers of our system is transparency. Uh, though historically the intelligence community has not been happy about being transparent for sources and methods, is this Seth a position or a threat in which we should be more willing to out the entities given our national security capacity at the NSA or at the Bureau or at Justice in order to demonstrate to the public that this may be true but realize or this may be untrue but this is the source of where this information is coming and you should be suspect. Are you, given your historic military background, would you be more willing to make the sources and methods more transparent and more open? Yeah, I, I think we have historical precedents at least for outlining it. I mean, as Burton will remember in the 1980s, one of the things that Bill Casey, uh, among others, brought to the government during the Reagan years was the establishment of an active measures working group. And that active measures working group cut across U.S. government agencies. So it had FBI, state, uh, CIA. It had the uh, uh, U.S. information agency. And it was dedicated uh, to defensive operations, and that is identifying cases of Russian disinformation and getting that information not just out. The State Department had the lead so it could get information out to the American population which the CIA, for example, couldn't because it can't, it can't influence uh, US, the U.S. domestic population. But 
but other U.S. government agencies can. Uh, it, could, it could take that information, and it did it with AIDS, the AIDS uh, disinformation campaign to allies and to journalists, and it could do it generally pretty quickly. Take, in, in not all cases was it made transparent the technical means for, for that information, but it was an interagency body that was able to move fairly quickly to dispel these campaigns. And I think that, I, I don't, maybe there are things going on that I'm not aware of. I don't see us developing that kind of interagency capacity. We have the ability to do it. We did it with counterterrorism after 9-11. We did it during the late Cold War period. Have we done it sufficiently today? My view, not yet. But I think in this competitive arena, we're going to have to. So there is, you know, we talk about transparency, but we do believe in secrecy. I mean, secrecy is mentioned in Article One of the Constitution for proceedings. Ironically, the court is extremely famous for having its deliberations not being public, privately, and then showing its work with an opinion. But we are very, very careful of not wanting to have the deliberations made public. Uh, so part of the aspect is how do you balance this issue for legitimate secrecy? And in Suzanne's other pieces, she often uses a piece in which we do with, um, since we also keep secret our grand jury material, uh, the 6E stuff is not made public, and we also make juvenile proceedings for the uh, privacy of the children involved also secret. And that's been also been exploited. So how do you... And we're increasingly moving from jury trials to arbitration, yeah. uh, which, which is all done behind closed doors, and the results of which are often kept secret. Yes. So the system is becoming less transparent mm -hmm. in many ways. And, yeah. I, yes, and the other thing is I'm involved in many non-disclosure agreements, which has never been a big aspect of the court system. But our our so criminal I, trials are always open. Uh, federal trials are always open. Uh, so Laura, how do you respond to that sort of little twitch in the process where we understand this need for secrecy, but yet we believe, as you do, in transparency. So I thought the next panel was going to have all the solutions <laughs> already. Um, look, I mean, I don't think that um, the, the attacks on the justice system that we're seeing coming out of Russia really change all that much in the ultimate kind of balance here. You need, I mean, the transparency that we need is so that people, it, it's the public education component of it. We need to actually understand what is coming from Russian bots versus what is coming from a real American person with a heartbeat, you know, and we need to be able to identify those things so that people can make informed decisions. And, you know, that to me is just, that's, that's the floor. Um, from there, then there's a lot of really challenging public policy issues that, that need to be grappled with, but we've got to start there. And I don't I don't think that I don't think that really changes much, um, or kind of address it, or um, is affected too much by the sort of ongoing challenges of dealing with kind of the need for secrecy within the court system and um, uh, uh, and the need for transparency. Do I have any more questions from the audience? Oh, excellent. You might say who you are. Yes, I'm Sheila Ramos from the Project on Foresight and Democracy. Um, I am curious, uh, the third recommendation up there that says expand civics and media literacy trainings as a national security imperative, what do you mean by that? So the sex panel will be devoted to <laughs> articulating that. So I will hesitate, but I think you have for you your first question. Uh, for the panels, uh, Elizabeth. And, and I think it, it really just it very quickly that uh, you know what we were trying what we're trying to say here is that uh, civics training is a way of building public resilience against what we see as a national security threat. So what we've described here, we believe, is a national security threat. And on top of that's yeah, the point. On top that's of that, point. I was just at an MIT this weekend. One of the things in the debate is how do you actually establish truth? Given what we have, and given one of the arguments about, if you look at the report, one of Putin's targets is his own population. His own population has lived through 50 plus years of them not ever knowing what the truth is. They're very happy and live in a, a state of not believing anything 
because of what they have grown up, and they're very, very shrewd at that. So I don't know how to pose that question. Let me go to the audience, but I want you to think as my last question will be is, how do you feel comfortable how you have mechanisms? Now we have court systems that usually, and the courts are the last arbiter of establishing yeah, but, what we believe are facts and truths. But just on that point, I mean, it's a really interesting question because you know, in our system, it's an adversarial system, right? There is no received truth. You, uh, party A makes one argument, party B makes the other argument, and you fight it out. And the jury, if it's a criminal case or even a civil case, the jury decides. And there is no received truth, right? That, that's what the, the, the result is. Unlike the European system where it's a more inquisitorial model and the judge's job, and by the way, the judge is also the prosecutor often, their job is to find the truth. And so our system, even though uh, you know, our, our society is built upon sort of objective ideas of truth, and that's what makes us so strong relative to totalitarian systems where the truth is whatever the guy in charge happens to say it is, on the other hand, our legal system is premised on the idea that there is no truth going in, and it's up to the system to figure out, uh, at least where it's contested, well, right? I, Justice Brennan used to like to say, there is a clear truth. It's when I get four more votes. <laughs> uh, just, 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 just to add one, one quick, quick comment along these lines, there are other ways that we have done this. The late Cold War period, we had congressional testimony by senior Department of Justice, uh, CIA and FBI officials, and as part of the testimony released major declassified uh, assessments from our intelligence communities on the nature of the Russian disinformation threat. That is also a way to get information. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, Kathy Cosman. Um, I was wondering if in addition to uh, Russian disinformation or propaganda campaigns, whatever you want to call it, is trying and somewhat successfully deepening tensions and fissures in US public opinion. I think it's also putting forth its own propaganda, which is uh, patriarchal or traditional values, which it's also very busy selling to its own population, sadly with some success. I mean, I could go into more detail, but I'd like to hear sure. you know, what you're saying. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, and again, I. Uh, Heather Conley uh, talks about this very eloquently in both her Kremlin Playbook 1 and in the more recent uh, Kremlin Playbook 2, uh, that, that that is, you know, I, I think you're exactly right, that Putin wants to be seen as the protector of these fundamental values um, that, 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 the Ill, you know, that the liberal West you know, has lost uh, track of and, and has uh, wrapped himself uh, very closely with the church um, and, and I think you're exactly right. And wants to be seen around the world as the protector of those. Yep. Any other question? Yes, sir. Uh, Lauren Hershey, I've been active with the ABA committee for about 30 years. <laughs> uh, 32 years ago, I happened to go to the old Soviet Union with an ABA committee. As I recall, it was uh, late March, early April of 1987. Two words had just come into play, uh, perestroika and glasnost. And when we would meet our counterparts with the equivalent of the ABA or watch a, a trial in progress, uh, I was told uh, at some point, you can use the word perestroika, don't use the word glasnost. We don't want to talk about that in public. Even though it was being reported that uh, Gorbachev at the time was introducing these two profound concepts to their society. So I have a question about uh, the use of uh, the ABA to promote exchanges. Uh, how, how fast can we go? How soon? How many hundreds can we get over there? Show our face, show our uh, integrity, show our uh, toughness, if you will. And then what is the use of uh, public diplomacy as opposed to diplomacy and law enforcement and counterintelligence? Sure. Um, so f for the ABA, uh, in the I would say late uh, 90s and around the, um, I was very much involved in one of my, another public policy successes, Russian legal reform. Um, <laughs> I use the word ironically uh, because- for a short while. Yes, we had an opening and the opening we helped educate and train a number of scores of Russian judges and we actually convinced the Russian um, uh, leadership that they should create an administrative office of federal courts 
And at that time, we convinced them that the AO leader should not be a judge, but a civilian. And the reason was that when you have two judges giving orders, the Chief Justice and another judge at the AO, there's potential problematic situation. That's the model we have historically fallen, followed, is to make sure, and they, they, they agreed. But then when Putin saw that one of the goals of the United States uh, AID and the ABA was to create civil societies of independent forces to help bring about democratic processes, he disbanded it and he jailed the people we had been using with uh, our organization. A clear indication of the ruthlessness and at a little level our openness and naivete of us to be able to say that's our goal, you're gonna love it, you're gonna love a democracy and you're gonna love being taken down, he reacted quite consistently the way an authoritarian does. And he systematically started removing the judges that we had helped educate and train and made it very clear that he wanted a certain type of justice to be followed. So I, it, it, we've, we have tried it. And the question is, at this point in time, would that be the most appropriate way to figure out what to do for internal mechanisms? Because in the end, Putin will die. And the question is, who will follow Putin? What will be the entities and how will we be engaged in this process? But we're, I, the time has flown. It's unbelievable how quickly this hour goes. But I would like to give you each an opportunity to sum up and say if there's one takeaway about the threat that you are particularly concerned about, what would that be if you had the ear of our uh, inner National Security Council to say, this is something you should be concerned about in the threat matrix that we have to focus on? I mean, I would just highlight the point that's been made repeatedly and, and make it again, and, and that, is, uh, th th that is if the Russians are successful on this front, which I don't think they will be in the end, uh, that that they, their goal in part is to undermine Americans' faith in its major institutions. One of them is the justice system. And that is what makes us strong. It is also, the other side of the coin, their most significant weakness because they do not have an open justice system. It is deeply corrupt and our biggest strength is their biggest weakness. And I think what Susanna put her finger on here, I would just to highlight, is just as important on our end as it is vulnerable on theirs. You should never be fear of repetition. It's how I've received tenure in a number of institutions. <laughs> so it's very powerful in the academic world. What would be your sort of... Well, let me say that. I, I echo that 100%. Um, so I think that's absolutely right. Repetition. Repetition, yeah. that's right. Um, no, but so focusing less on the threat and yeah. more just on what can we do about it, right? I think partnerships are what are really important. And speaking from the government perspective, as I said, we have an important role, uh, a significant role, but there's also lanes in the highway. And the government cannot solve this problem. This is something that requires active engagement on the part of our citizenry. We need help from the technology companies because uh, as Seth mentioned earlier, often it's on their platforms where a lot of this work is happening. They have terms of service that they can enforce. Um, so we need to make sure that we're working between the government and the private sector, between the government and the citizenry, and as a, as a society that we're uh, actively engaged in the problem and, and combating it. And what would be your... Well, I'm going to continue with the theme by um, repeating a bit of something that Suzanne said in her presentation, but which I think is so incredibly important that that's just, that's, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. Plus, I think it's just generally good in life to repeat Suzanne because she's always saying smart things. Um, but in terms of the stakes here, our courts, and this is also a good segue into the next panel, um, our courts are going to be asked to make incredibly high stakes decisions high stakes decisions involving really critical constitutional issues about our system of checks and balances in these next few years. Things that could really affect kind of the course of our system in the future. And in rooms like this, we're gonna be able to have really reasonable debates about what we think about the outcomes of those decisions. Some of us may agree, some may disagree, and we can have that really comfortable kind of academic debate. But at the end of the day, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, treat them as legitimate. And the question is, is the country going to treat them as legitimate, as law? And that's the thing that I'm most fundamentally worried about. Do you have a last word? Well, democracy is not inevitable. 
Um, we, we cannot be complacent. It's really, really hard to get your head around the idea that our democracy could seriously be in jeopardy. It seems so resilient and so robust. But we have to recognize that there are fissures that a determined adversary is taking advantage of exploiting and, and, and widening. And we cannot be complacent. So uh, I just would say that uh, I will segue to the next panel and that clearly allies, but we talk a lot about it's hard for the bench to defend itself. It's hard for judges to defend themselves. But that's the role of the bar and people in this room, and I think the next panel is going to talk about different stratagems for that. But there's no question there's a huge role for the bar. So I will pass on the next panel, and then I know that uh, Judge Turdoff will have all of the appropriate answers for this. So I'm looking forward to, for you to help give us the path forward, Judge, as always. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. to this project a great sensitivity that it is our judiciary that is the most trusted of our branches, surveys tell us this, that is our jewel, and that there's no reason to think that the Russian efforts would end with tampering with our electoral systems, um, I should say our election systems, and that the judges were clearly likely to be an institution, our courts at risk. And we started by thinking about how secure were they in their computer technology, and Suzanne, of course, then expanded our thinking to the threats from social media. And Harvey um, stepped in and said, you know, we know that courts and judges don't defend themselves by tradition. Uh, they have to rely on the bar and citizen leaders to do so. They, they worry that if they step into the fray, they politicize themselves. So we needed to have a, a ready response mechanism. And at that point, we said to ourselves, okay, a response mechanism, what about the audience? Is the audience, that would be our public, our citizens, are they ready to receive the message? How well do they understand the role of the courts and their importance? And it was John who picked up on this and said, let's do what I'll call something of an environmental scan. And when we did that, we saw that the state of civic education was not what we wanted. Indeed, one judge described it in California as abysmal. And I'm afraid that's not a bad characterization. And so we stepped back and said, we really have a four pillar effort here. Yes, computer security, knowing what the threat is, addressing the disinformation campaign that has been so well described, making sure we're ready to defend and respond, but we've also got to reach more broadly. So this panel then helps me understand why national security and legal education, which have been the two themes of my career, do fit together. And I'm going to start then with you, Judge Fogel. Mm -hmm. We first came to know one another when you were head of the core training capacity as a director of the federal 
Judicial Center where we train our federal judges, and now you're heading a new center at Berkeley, uh, the Berkeley Institute, pardon me, I got it wrong, Judicial right. Institute. So I want to start by asking you to give us a, a, a deep understanding of what do judges do? Do we know what judges do? Okay, well, uh, that is the right question, Elizabeth. I mean, it, it, um, it um, I was a judge for 37 years. I, I retired uh, from that role last fall to start this institute at Berkeley. And one of the inspirations for doing that, actually, was the sense that the judiciary does need to respond more robustly to the challenges that it faces, and that judges are not really able to do that. If they're sitting judges, they're bound by the code of conduct. They're, they're very limited in what they can say. And some of these uh, uh, things that the judiciary is struggling with are actually quite uh, dawning, they're quite serious, and uh, the idea was that as a former judge and somebody who had been a judge for a very long time and having the relationships I had, I could get some of these forces working together. That's kind of the, the thing that motivated me to do it. And I've been very interested in the efforts to do civics education over the last uh, decade or so. I think there's been a tremendous amount of good work done. But I would say, and I mean this uh, in, in the most constructive way, I think it's been very broad, but it hasn't been very deep. In other words, there's been a conversation about what the uh, role of the three branches of government is and how the system of checks and balances works and uh, you know, how the court and the president and the Congress uh, work. But we don't have a picture, the public does not have a picture of what judges actually do. And to the extent that the public does have such a picture, they get it in, in some rather quirky ways. They get it by watching TV or watching movies, you know, so they'll see Judge Judy or they'll see movies about the, the law in which the main thing the judge does is pound the gavel. Um, and I've had kids visit my courtroom and say, where's your gavel? You know, it's like as if that was the main tool of my trade. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, so the media images of judges are, are very uh, shallow and, and uh, dramatic. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the Supreme Court, uh, it takes the most difficult cases. It, it takes about 75 or 80 cases a year. They tend to be the most difficult cases. They tend to be the most divisive social issues. And so you get um, a lot of cases that are five to four, or six to three, where you have uh, pretty strong philosophical divisions, <clears throat> which tend to line up with, not always, but tend to line up with the uh, political party that uh, the, the judge justice comes from. The confirmation process has gotten extremely contentious. And so um, the public thinks, well, you have these, these TV and movie judges, and then you have the Supreme Court, where you have uh, political divisions and political agendas. And what they don't see is what the thousands and thousands of judges in the trial courts and the state and federal system, the, the appellate judges in the state and federal systems around the country, what those people actually do, how they think, how they decide cases. They have no sense, really, of what the legal culture is. And we actually have a wonderful legal culture. I really have to agree with the comments that were made earlier. When you, Harvey's comment about the, the, the one of our exports being U.S. judges. I, I just got back from Uzbekistan, uh, which is an interesting country, but it's certainly not a model of, uh, of uh, freedom. If you look back, and it, is, it is history. Um, and they're looking to us. They're looking to us for, uh, well, how do judges actually do that? You know, to have that independence, have that stature in society, have the respect that they enjoy. And, and the reason I think it happens is because we have a very strong legal culture. If, if you look at the Supreme Court, um, actually most of the decisions in any given year are not five to four decisions. There are a lot of unanimous decisions. There are eight to one decisions. There tends to be a lot more consensus than actually people know about, but it doesn't get a lot of publicity. Uh, if you put a group of 100 judges in a room and you gave them a case, you would probably find agreement 95, 96 of the cases, the judges would agree on how the case should be decided. The, 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 the differences are around the margins. And, and what you have in, in between the margins is uh, a set of decisional principles, a decisional process, uh, training, uh, an ethical code, uh, a, a sense of professionalism, a sense of the importance of independence. And, and then you look at the issues that these judges are deciding this is really important stuff. It's not the big social issues. It's not reproductive rights or, or, or voting rights or anything like that. It's, it's, it's things that are important to individual people in their individual lives. Who gets the kids? How long does somebody go to prison for? Uh, who prevails in a civil case? Uh, there are things that matter so much to people 
that judges decide every day, and they decide it in general in a very professional way. And we don't talk about that. Um, it's not perfect. There's all sorts of issues, and I, I know this as a trainer. You know, we have to deal with uh, variations in training. We have to deal with things like unconscious bias. We have to do things with public trust and confidence. But the main point is we have a system we can be proud of. We have judges we can be proud of, and we need to talk about them. So I'm going to jump over you, Ted McConnell, and yeah. go to Mary McQueen, yeah. who is the director of the National Center for State Courts. Judge Fogel, you've had experience, I know, in the state and federal system. Mary, you focus more on the state system. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about what your institution's doing to help with the challenges that the judge has, has described. Uh, the, I, I was looking at my friend Jeff here, and I said, if only I had 13 circuits. <laughs> uh, when you talk about the state court system, first of all, there is not a uniform system. Uh, you're looking at different ways of selecting judges, you're looking at different jurisdictional levels. Uh, when you look at Texas and Georgia, you're looking at a electrical wiring chart to try to figure out where uh, the courts are and what jurisdiction applies. But I do think that from the public's perspective, the majority of the justice they see are in the state courts. And uh, as Judge Fogel said, it's not in these really high-profile cases. It's debtor-creditor. It's family. It's housing. Uh, and it's those kinds of cases that I think uh, where the public has to develop their, their true trust and confidence uh, in the judges. And so it's, it's from the first time that somebody realizes that, uh, that there is a legal issue uh, and how are they dealt with. And so rather than, uh, I call it like, to know us is to trust us. That used to be kind of the mantra for, for judges. No, we have to engage those communities. We have to reach out and understand what their needs are, where they're coming from. And I'll give you an example. We did a series of PBS uh, town hall meetings that were publicized. And it was called Courting Justice. And, and someone would come in and say something like, well, why do you let people get on the stand and lie? You know, and, you're, and the first response for judges is, oh, well, let me explain the rules of evidence to you, <laughs> or the adversarial system. No, you have to respect where that person is coming from and reach out and engage them. And so I think in this issue of disinformation, uh, and especially, I think all roads lead through Suzanne. Uh, she uh, came to the Conference of Chief Justices uh, annual meeting last year uh, and really raised the, uh, uh, the, the concerns, and, and I know we'll talk later about what some of the attacks have been, but the, the point I guess I was trying to make is that instead of, of trying to uh, just superimpose what those of us who went to law school want to explain about the justice system. It's what people really ex expect. And uh, so we shifted, and I know Jeremy's familiar with this too, to procedural fairness. And what that means is we have to explain to someone what's going on. We have to take the time out and listen. Because while this may be the 20th case I've heard today as a judge, it's the most important thing that's happening in that person's life. And if we don't just take the time for them to respect the process that, that happened, you know, if it's just next, I think that that erodes the public trust and confidence. And so uh, we, we can tell, and, I, and we can talk later about some of the uh, uh, public opinion polls, but we know it makes a difference. So I would say that public trust and confidence, uh, I'll, I'll take a quote from Hamilton before he became a star on Broadway. Uh, and one of the Federalist Papers wrote that nothing contributes more to the public's respect and esteem for government than the effective administration of justice. Mm -hmm. So, Ted McConnell, you have been engaged in one way or another in civics education for many years. I wonder whether you could pick up on a concern that you know I have, that maybe we don't have quite the public we thought we did. And for me, this came to realization when our own Justice George in California named his commission 
to study the judiciary, not a commission on an independent judiciary, but an impartial judiciary, because he found surveys informed him that independent was translated as a runaway judiciary, out of control, not a third branch. So tell us a little bit about the state of civic education today. Yes, ma'am. But first, thank you to CSIS, to Dr. Hamry, to the incredible Suzanne Spaulding, to the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security, to Harvey, to Elizabeth, to the incredible uh, Holly Stewart McMahon. The civic education community deeply, deeply appreciates this opportunity to collaborate with you and to uh, work with you to highlight some of the concerns we've had for a long time. Suzanne's report is so very, very important in laying out exactly what happened. But I submit that there was an infection already going on. That these misdeeds pointed out in the report amplified and, and made much, much worse. These, uh, this infection threatens the very underpinnings of our republic, of support for the institutions that underlie our republic. And I submit to you that one of the very best antidotes for this infection is more and better civic education. First, let's define what is civic education. It's the principal reason, of course, that we have a system of public education in our country. The founders knew that they'd created this whole new setup in government and that the public had to be educated in how to exercise their rights and responsibilities responsibly. Civic education is the act of providing civic knowledge. We have three branches of government. Civic skills. Don't write your congressman if you're upset about your trash service. Write your city council person. And hopefully a disposition to be civically engaged. In other words, to keep Dr. Franklin's charge at the end of the Constitutional Convention to keep this republic. Let's talk about some of the scary statistics that underlie what I said a minute ago about the public uh, especially younger people's lack of understanding about our system of government, a great deal of which have to do with the lack of civic education. The noted researchers Foy and Monk found in 2011 that 24% of U.S. millennials, then in their late teens or early 20s, considered democracy to be a bad or very bad way of running the country. In January 2017, our friends at the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement at Tufts University found that 35% of millennials said they were losing faith in American democracy and just 25% were confident in the democratic system. 43% of voters nationwide at least somewhat agree with the statement that the Constitution made sense in the 18th century but it is irrelevant in the 21st century, according to a Scott Rasmussen survey released earlier this year. Now, this all didn't happen because of misinformation in the last couple of years. A major underpinning for these findings in these surveys are a fact that civic education has largely been squozen out, squeezed out, of the curriculum in schools all across this country. We can date the beginning of this to an October night in 1957 when the Russians, then going by the name of the Soviet Union, launched a basketball thing into space called Sputnik. And we began one of our periodic national panics. Oh my goodness gracious, we're falling behind everybody in the world in math, English, and science. We've got to do something about this which has had a result over the years of squeezing civic learning out of the curriculum. Case in point, until the 1960s, and some of us with white hair in this audience may remember some of these courses, there were three distinct courses on civic education at high school. Now, in most states, we're down to one course, generally one semester, that concentrates on the dry mechanics of government rather than why we should be civically engaged. At the elementary grades, civic learning has been cut by two-thirds. I say we need a Sputnik moment for civic education. Well, that's a powerful, what shall we say, call to action. 
Um, and on the subject of action, Jeff Manier, you've had a wonderfully interesting career. You've been an assistant solicitor general, so you've appeared before the highest court, but now you also serve as the counselor to the Chief Justice. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you see that, what shall we say, senior court in the land participating in our work here? Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to the whole CSIS team and Dr. Hamley, uh, Suzanne Harvey, for putting on this very important program. Uh, We've been talking about public trust. I think that's what is at the core of the, the matter here. And I'd like to start with just an obvious point, and that is for the courts to earn public trust, they must do their job well. Now, what does that mean? That means that judges have to demonstrate impartiality and independence. It means they have to fulfill their core responsibility of just, speedy, and inexpensive resolution of legal disputes. And it also means, I think, that they need to elevate the, the discourse and show civility, show the, the ways in which legal matters are resolved is through intelligent civil discourse and set that example uh, for the nation. Now, I think our judges by and law, large are great. They're not perfect, but I think every judge has to aspire to meet these standards uh, because it reduces the level of exposure we have to attacks that the Russians might bring about. Uh, of course, it's great that we do our job well, but there's a second element of that, and that has also been touched upon, and that's transparency. Uh, the public has to be able to see the courts in action doing their job well, doing, administering justice fairly and impartially. Uh, and I think the courts have made major efforts along those lines, uh, particularly in the past 15 to 20 years, and in thanks in large part to what is the source of some of our current problems, the internet. Uh, since 2000, I'll use the, court, the Supreme Court as an example, it's had a website and it's been able to put its court opinions on, online so that initially they're available within hours after release, now they're available within a minute after release. So the public has access to the actual reasoning of the courts. Uh, since that time, uh, we've also added transcripts of the oral arguments that began in 2006. Those are now available at, almost in instantaneously, the same afternoon as the arguments take place. We've also added the uh, audio transcripts as well, so people can actually hear the dialogue that takes place in the court. And I think that's beneficial. That's been in place since, since 2010. Uh, all of those things help to, uh, to, to show that the, the court is a well-functioning organization. But I think the fact is, I mean, how many people go off and read Supreme Court opinions? Uh, Justice Kagan wrote a wonderful opinion about uh, the sovereign immunity of the Tennessee Valley Authority on Monday. My guess is not many people here have picked it up, uh, despite the, the fine legal reasoning that she demonstrated for a unanimous court. Uh, I think the third component here is we really rely on other parties. Uh, we rely first, we have a wonderful Supreme Court press corps, I want to give a shout out to them. They are professional, they're knowledgeable, and they do a great deal to ensure that the, uh, the court's decisions are, adequate, are accurately portrayed. Uh, and they oftentimes call our public information office informally to make sure that falsehoods that might be going around are clarified, and they do a part in clarifying them themselves. We also rely on uh, non-governmental uh, non agencies that play an important role in talking about the courts. Uh, we rely on the bar, the organized bar, to speak on behalf of the courts, because obviously the court has a tradition of not speaking on its own behalf. I think, again, to quote Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 78, he said that uh, uh, the court is the least dangerous branch because it has neither the power of the purse nor the power of the sword. It also doesn't have megaphones. It does not have the power of the bully pulpit. And so we have to rely on others to make our case for us. And that includes the other branches of government as well. Uh, I think they have an important role just uh, in defending our branch uh, from the attacks that are, are made upon it, uh, oftentimes from insidious sources. Great. Mary, I'm going to come back to you and see if you can pick up on some of the comments that we've just heard Jeff make. What kinds of things are, are you doing to deal with j judges who sit at not the highest court of the land, but in all of our, our states? Well, if, if I could, I would just like to acknowledge uh, that it is law day. And one of the ways the Conference of Chief Justices recognizes that is they launched a a uh, student essay contest. And uh, today we were announcing the winners of that, but it's from elementary school, middle school, and high school. And this year the winners had to write on the First Amendment. 
And so it's a way of reaching out because I think it has to be almost an Eric's, uh, Eric's, ex, I can never say it, experiential. 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 Yeah. experiential uh, yeah. Opportunity. So you'll see a lot of state courts now reviving what we all learned a few years ago were called teen courts, where instead of when you have certain types of juvenile cases that come before the court, the students act as the judge, the prosecutor, the public defender, and learn to fact check, right? I mean, Harvey was talking about the adversarial system. They understand about how courts weigh the facts. And so I would say that that, you know, starting earlier, but that is really applying mm -hmm. civics education in a way that I think is very important. The other thing I would, I would point out that Jeff mentioned, and there is a, a conference of court public information officers that, that readily uh, work with um, uh, the media. Uh, but we also have sponsored with Loyola in uh, LA a law school for journalists mm -hmm. because I think that there's a, a real need to understand why and how the courts make their decisions other than it's politically motivated. Because for instance, uh, one of the things that we point out now is when there's something about the courts in the media or online, the first thing they say is they were appointed by an R or a D. So that whole politicalization of the bench, I think, undermines the legitimacy. Um, I would also mention that um, because of the internet and because of electronic filing in both the federal and state courts, there's a dramatic increase in the demand of the public for information about courts, for information about judges. And they want it free of charge. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so right now the state courts have a national uh, open data standards project underway where instead of just trying to, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at a docket, but if you think you're going to learn a lot about what happened in the court by reading the docket entries. You're having trouble sleeping. I was going to say <laughs> that would be the other thing. Yeah. Um, and so what we're trying to do is say, okay, if you're interested in how domestic violence cases are handled or how uh, 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 certain types of criminal cases are handled or family cases. We're trying to identify data sets. Uh, that these are the four or five different types of data that if somebody wanted to ask that question that we could just make available to them. But this is to the public. It, it reinforces that transparency. Uh, I, say, I would say also going along those lines is uh, the the trying to demystify the process. I always laugh that if, uh, you know, if Adams or Jefferson came back today, they could probably still practice in the courts. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that we need to have it be more, I'm gonna use a term that, uh, that I think we all kind of roll our eyes, user friendly. Mm -hmm. but, but in some ways, understanding that, because sometimes we, we've done, uh, uh, public forums and public uh, listening where you, where when you use the word independent, people think that you mean out of control, yeah. no accountability. But when you talk about fair and impartial courts and, and everybody understanding that the role of the courts is to protect your individual rights, they all embrace that. Well, and, and to your, so I totally agree with this point, Mary, and I think as a person who was a judge for a long time, I think one of the things that we need to be self-critical about and we need to do better is we need to speak English. You know, we, 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 we look in terms of our own internal dialogue, right? You know, lawyers appear in court and we have this language that we use and we have these ways of relating to people. And if you came up the way a lot of judges did, if you came up, you know, through law school, I mean, talking about the federal courts now, you came up through law school and a clerkship and a big law firm and all of a sudden you're, you're, you, you've never had to deal with real people, you know? It's like you're, you're, you're in this kind of elite place. It's, it's a little bit better in the state courts because a lot of judges have to run for election, so they, they can't get away with that. But, but you have to be able to go out to a group of people. It could be a rotary club, it could be a school group, it could, be, right. it could be people anywhere in your community and, and just talk to them about what you do. And you have to be able to do it in a way that they can actually understand. And I think that's actually a really good story. 
I mean, I have always loved doing that. I've done it with journalists too, that, that people are really interested in what I do. That they want to know, you know. Sometimes they ask me really crazy questions like, you know, how many traffic tickets do you find in favor of the uh, defendant? You know, that kind of thing. But, and I say not very many, but, you know, it's like you, you, you kind of have that kind of conversation. And, and that, I think, builds public trust and confidence. And I think we tend to be a little bit insular in the way we communicate. I think we could do better at let that. Me just, let yeah, me just make yeah. two, two really quick points. Yeah. Because one of the issues yeah. that I think you identify in the report was this issue about immigrants and, and the divisiveness that now some of those yeah. issues bring. Well, the state courts actually are on the forefront of uh, ensuring that there is a group of certified language interpreters, over 30 languages. Now, you have to go outside the globe to find another justice system that is that inclusive, that wants to make sure that people that come before it either as witnesses or litigants are understood. Not only that they understand, but the judge understands. The other thing that I just wanted to, to mention uh, very quickly was juries. Juries is, jury service is on the decline. Uh, for a lot of reasons, one being the economic impact uh, on certain uh, challenged groups uh, to the point that we're trying to look at maybe uh, tax incentives for uh, small businesses to provide for jury leave because it, now, I mean, even though providing justice comes before providing for the national defense and the Constitution, you know, the National Guard gets two weeks a year of paid leave to practice but there is no uh, remuneration for somebody that's working on uh, serving on a jury. So if you're lucky enough to have one or two minimum wage jobs, you can't afford to not work to come in to serve on a jury for $10 a day. And so in Louisville, they were having a real problem. Of, not that the pool wasn't representative. Now, what I mean by that is that they didn't, they didn't just pull it from registered voters. You know, they tried to get people that drive, they tried to get people that were on public service, but the people that could afford to come to being jurors, you know, we're moving from now a cultural issue versus an economic one, but what, what really spoke to people was that they, they reached out to persons of color and persons from different cultural backgrounds to more or less reach out to their communities. And so if you can think about the bus system, on the side of the bus, there would be a big picture that said, it was fair because I was there. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so I think the jury system is one of our opportunities to reinforce the fair and impartiality. Of the Before case. I come back to Ted, I want to give you, Judge Vogel, a chance to just say what you hope to do with your new institute, where I know your goals are really right at the core of what we've been talking so, about. So, as I always say, sort of the elevator speech is, um, ethics, resiliency, and independence. <clears throat> and they all go together. So uh, I think it's important that judges be ethical and that they also be perceived as ethical. So there's all of the things we've been talking about that it's the judge's responsibility to be ethical and, and then we have to figure out how to communicate to the rest of the world that this ethical uh, set of values judges have is, is core. And so your audience is not simply other judges. Oh no, no, it's, it's much broader than that. Resilience, being a judge is actually a really hard job. Uh, there are um, instances, particularly in the state courts, of judges getting PTSD, judges getting um, uh, stress-related illnesses, uh, higher than normal incidences of high blood pressure, chemical dependency, all related to work. And you know, this is an untold story, it's, it, but it's a story that needs to be told. We need to, we need to work at that. We need to figure out how to take better care of ourselves. So that's another uh, high, uh, high value uh, target. And then, and then the independence, and I completely agree that when you talk about independence in the abstract, it scares people because they think you're talking about being unhinged and doing whatever you want. But the idea that you can, uh, you can rule against the government, you can, you can rule against the, the people in power. Uh, I love the, 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 the references to the Ukrainians. One of my first experiences uh, when I was, came to the FJC, we had the highest court in the Ukraine come to the FJC for, a, for an exchange. And they asked us, they said, well, what happens when you rule against the government? And I said, nothing. You know, I mean, you go on. I mean, you, we have life tenure, I mean, it doesn't affect. And they thought I was insulting them. I was insulting their intelligence. 
because they were so cynical. They were, they, just as it's been described by others today, they've never had the experience of an independent judiciary. So just being able to say, no, actually you get to do that and it doesn't ruin your career. You know, and just the importance of that value, finding ways to talk about that. And I think in all three points, it's finding ways to talk about it in ways that, that people can hear. So in that yeah. little yeah. vignette, yeah. you characterize quickly the difference in <clears throat> our system and other systems. Mm -hmm. So Ted, what do we do to restore a much broader appreciation and understanding through civic education? What's your prescription? We've got to spend more time and more resources on the subject. We have to make it more relevant to students today. We have to meet them where they live. If you're a, a student of color in a, going to school serving a, a lower SES community, all this talk about how wonderful our judiciary is, how independent it is, how benevolent our judges are, does not ring true to mm -hmm. you. We've got to have, and, and in fact, uh, I, I will tell you, I was talking about all the negatives, that, uh, how civic education has been virtually squeezed out of the curriculum in, in far too many schools, and that's absolutely true. At the same time, the supplemental civic education community uh, Programs like Justice Sandra Day O'Connor's iCivics program, uh, the Constitutional Rights program, program of uh, the Public Education Division of the American Bar Association, make civics come alive and relevant and interesting to students. The problem is teachers don't have the time and the resources to bring it into the classrooms. So it's a matter of convincing policymakers, principally at the state and local level, and under our system of, uh, of any aspect of public policy in our country, nothing is more sacrosanct that it is a matter of state and local control than education policy. We've got to convince state and local education policy makers they have to make more time and they have to provide more resources. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Civics Now Coalition, C-I-B-X Now exclamation point coalition, uh, that it, our civic education community has recently formed has developed a comprehensive policy menu that can walk the states through what they can do to restore their essential civic mission of their state schools, including course sequencing, time that's needed, resources that are needed. Uh, and I think in a minute maybe we can talk about well, tell us the about the national level. level. Here okay. we are in Washington, D.C. Nothing for us to do. Oh, there are a few things we can do nationally, federally, that will make a big difference. The most reliable measure of how well we're doing in any curricular area is called the National Assessment of Educational Progress. We do and the NAEPs, to shorthand. We do NAEPs in math, in English, in science, in civics, in history. For the past 20 years, the NAEP in civics has been flat, basically only 23% of American uh, students surveyed at 4th, 8th, and 12th grade can show a frankly dumbed down proficiency in this area. But here's the problem, unlike math, unlike English, unlike science, the NAEP in civics is not provided by state level data. So it's just a national aggregate. So we can't shame a state. Now look, I'm gonna pick on my home state of Idaho. We can't go to the people in Idaho and say, you're 45th in the country, you need to do better without that information. So Congress can easily fix that. That's point number one, provide state level data from the NAEPs. Point two, we provide billions of dollars from the Federal Department of Education and a few other agencies to support math instruction, English instruction, science instruction, innovation. We provide right now $3 million only for civic education and roughly about $5 million for history. Oh, come on, that's not enough. We need to dramatically increase federal investment in civic and history education innovation, and we need to explore the establishment of a national endowment for civics and civic engagement. That's not much. We can no. do it. It's a prescription. Especially with you all's help. 
So before I turn it over to the audience, Jeff, I want to just give you a chance to comment on civic engagement and the leadership that the court you serve might show in this regard. And okay. already does. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. And We've Elizabeth. already mentioned Sandra Dale. And I think that's true. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is a great example with her ICE civics program. Uh, and Justice Sotomayor has followed in her footsteps. It's on the board of that and is also engaged in, in that formal program. Uh, but the justices also are focused on reaching out to the public, primarily through educational programs, uh, meeting with students. And I think the one-on-one -on -one meeting with the justice can be very, very effective, even though it's small scale. And to give an example of that, today on Law Day, uh, Chief Justice Roberts is meeting with a group called Legal Outreach. And this is a, a, an organization based in New York City, which is really designed to encourage uh, underserved community kids to getting involved in a, uh, a, prof a professional career in the law. And they have a basically an essay type program to encourage kids to participate in this. And they've had a very high success rate. And the winners of the essay program are coming in with, for a meeting with the Chief Justice. It's only reaching a handful of people, but still, I think all of these efforts are important. I wonder if I can go back to, to the threat panel too, just to mention something that I think uh, is a cause of concern for me, and I want to make sure it's fully aired. And it's something that actually comes out of Secretary Chertoff's book. He's written a book called Exploding Data mm -hmm. and Cybersecurity in the Digital Age. And one of the points he makes is that we see only a small part of what the real problem is because of the dark web. There's a lot, there's a large conversation that's going on that we're not privy to. And I think in that sense, this problem is bigger than we might realize from just the examples that have been very uh, you know, very effectively conveyed by, by Suzanne. And I just want to make that point to underscore that this, this problem is probably bigger than we realize in terms of the amount of misinformation and, uh, and, and fake news, for lack of a better word, that is out there that we are not seeing. And criminal activity. Yes. So it sounds like this panel is unanimous in believing that there's a national security imperative to improving our understanding and civic education outreach. Yeah. So maybe it's time now to go to the audience and see whether you have questions for the, we'll start right here. And I guess we have mics that will circulate around. Thank you, and thank uh, Chris Bidwell, thank you for the great uh, panel. Um, as I listened to both in the first group and the second group, uh, you identified the problem, identified the imperative, the, 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 need, the why of the need to, to deal with, with better civic education, but a lot of the solutions tended to be in the vaccine category as opposed to people that have grown up into society that did not get vaccinated. And in their minds in that six inch space, that war for, uh, for ideas and, and uh, the, the information campaigns that launched by the Russians seem to be winning some of the battles in some of these minds. From a human point of view, from a psychological point of view, how do you tell someone, how do you convince someone that, gee, maybe you're, you need to rethink what websites you're visiting every day and, 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 and you know, give the, judge a chance, the judges and, and the, the system a chance to, to show its fairness. Um, if any, any ideas on that matter would, would be most welcome. Thank you. You want to do that? Uh, later this month, Suzanne's going to be helping us uh, host a uh, national workforce on rapid response and sp specifically responding to uh, my grandchildren think I'm so great because I know what a sock puppet is. Um, <laughs> uh, and so let me give you an example because um, in the Tibbetts case I'll use as an example, the, the 50 states barely, some of them are still not automated. I mean, we do not have, uh, because some of them are state funded, some of them are locally funded. So unlike the federal courts, um, one of the things we'll be talking about is should the National Center for State Courts establish the ability to track what's going on, you know, what, what type of, of uh, activity we're seeing, which is, is kind of identifying the problem. But then it's, it's establishing what's the message and who's the messenger. And so uh, we're looking at uh, 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 not only utilizing lawyers, but law students. Uh, more of the, the social media experts. We had an attack on the National Center's website uh, a year or so ago, and I happened to have a daughter who was at Georgia Tech. Y'all can't tell that from my, my 
accent, I'm sure. Um, and uh, one, of, uh, one of her friends came and says, don't you know somebody who works at the National Center for State Courts? And she says, oh yeah. And all of a sudden, there was this group of engineering students at Georgia Tech who, who basically became the troll posse and responded in a way that I don't think former judges, sitting judges, and lawyers could have. And so what we're gonna be trying to do uh, with this work group later in the month is identify the rapid response uh, uh, opportunities uh, for the state courts beyond civic education. We think civic, because I see this as kind of long term and short term, we've got to deal with this threat now. When you have people undermining or providing misinformation about how courts are operating or how someone was dealt with or whether or not, uh, and, and we've seen it, uh, the attacks on individual judges as well as j just the overall process. So I just wanted to make sure that, uh, and, I, and, and uh, I think Suzanne and uh, her colleagues are the very impetus for the state courts realizing they had to develop that type of, of rapid response. And, and I'd like to underscore, go ahead. one never interrupts the judge, oh, no. but I will. <laughs> uh, if it please the courts. No, no. May it please the courts. No, you go ahead. I think it's really important, the point yeah. you've just made, that we need to go beyond judges, yeah. lawyers, law students. Yeah. We speak to ourselves, we need to speak more broadly. And no, I was, gonna, I was gonna agree with all that and I agree with what you just said. Um, I also think, and maybe this is an old fashioned idea, I never thought I would consider myself old fashioned. I think human contact is a good thing. You know, I, I don't do Facebook, but I, I, I go on Twitter in the morning to get the news. And I think my, my view of human nature has declined steadily as, as, as I've done that because, because it's just, you know, you just get a very strange view of things. And, and somehow I think, well, how many people actually know a judge, right? I mean, you know, have ever talked to somebody about what they do, you know? I, th I think it's, it's, it's everything Mary said, everything you said, Elizabeth, absolutely right. And I think that's gonna be the immediate response that has to occur when these attacks. But I think longer term, and in addition to all of the civics education work, there's something about humanizing the people who work in the system. So it's not just this black box over here. You know, I think that's it's it's a it's another it's another piece of it. Right, relying on, yeah. if you will, yeah. the incendiary movies and yeah. so on yeah. to kind of yeah. set the yeah. narrative. Yeah. But Ted, you seem to have yeah. something on your mind. Yes. We, what? And responding, judge and, and yeah. Mary, yeah. we need to get every judge in the country into a classroom. Yep. That's that's yeah. part that will help. Every child. Every judge. Every, every judge, judge into a classroom, yeah. and yes, every child into a classroom too. But okay. Thankfully, our graduation rates are going up. Uh, there have been developed very, very effective. Media literacy is part of effective civic learning. That's where it, it falls in, in the classroom. There have been some tremendous teaching strategies, teaching methods, uh, curricular materials developed that do just that, help kids understand this is propaganda, this isn't true, uh, that help kids understand the responsible use of social media. The problem, once again, don't mean to be a broken record here, the problem, one, or too repetitious, the problem is, once again, finding the time in the school day so that students can experience these proven teaching strategies. And what would you teach the judges? How to go into a club. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and there are, in fact, a lot of programs. Uh, Chief Justice Kantel Sakiui in, in California, who I know you know well, uh, has a program of sending judges in the classroom. Uh, it's a matter of judges going in and being relatable civics yes. teachers. Well, Starting, and you'd be, you'd be the best at this. Just going in and going, hi, I'm, I'm Jeremy, I'm a judge, and this is what I do. And it's not that mystical. Now, I have a question, but I said the audience gets a chance here, so right here in the front. Thank you. Herb Rose, uh, I'm a concerned citizen. And on some days, I'm a cynic. And on other days, I'm a skeptic. Uh, I had a course in civics in eighth grade, which was many years ago. I can't remember too many of the specifics. But I'm wondering what you tell a civics teacher today who has to contend with 
uh, somebody who is spokesman for one branch of the government uh, condemning the other two branches of the government and the fourth estate. Uh, and in cases of uh, the judiciary, um, speaking ill of certain judges, both on being biased and perhaps on their ethnicity. Um, how do you teach students uh, what's appropriate in uh, 2019 and 2020? Who wants to take it? Do you want One to of the most engaging and effective ways of providing civic education is having guided discussions of controversial issues. Letting the students talk about issues that resonate with them and helping them understand how to have these conversations in a respectful, listening manner. This, this is responsive to your question. Give me a second here. Uh, there is a huge, again, body of work that's been developed to help teachers do just this. Here's the problem. The vast majority of civics teachers, social studies teachers, have to think twice, if not thrice, before having a discussion of a controversial issue in a classroom for fear of community or administrator backlash. And when students want to talk about, fill in the headline from recently, want to talk about this issue and it's vitally important to them, and they can't have that discussion in a classroom because the administrator says, don't you dare talk about, fill in the controversial issue in our school, for fear the parents are going to come down on us. One, that's inauthentic to the students and alienates them further to what a missed educational opportunity. So part of how you do that is allowing the students to talk about the specifics that you just cited there. Have a respectful discussion about it and allow the students to help inform each other's discretion on an issue. But Ted, you raised another point here, or perhaps I, I hear it coming up, and that is our teachers have not been taught civic education either, the current generation. I first learned this when the leading um, uh, public policy education uh, person at the Irvine Foundation told me that I was stunned. She said, we don't have a teacher corps that could deliver the kind of curriculum that you think is important, Elizabeth. What did she mean? She meant that it's been a long time since we prepared our teachers for the kind of conversations that we should be having, and they are, by logic, frightened now at wading into areas that they don't know about. But I thought you were also going to tell us that there's hope, let's not end on a totally bleak note, in Illinois, the Robert McCormick Foundation has stepped in. Did you want to say anything about that? We have a number of success stories from around the country, but the one you're alluding to, Illinois was one of the states in the country where you did not have to take a civics course in order to graduate high school. Unbelievable. So, led by the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, a group of frontline civic educators got together and decided to do something about that. Got a bill passed here two years ago requiring that you have to take a high school interactive modern teaching strategies, civics course in order to graduate high school in Illinois. Great, the problem was you have to teach the teachers how to teach it, provide professional development. Illinois claims it's a broke state in the country. I think there might be some evidence to back that up. So the McCormick Foundation joined with a few other foundations, joined together and provided the professional development so every single Illinois high school civics and social studies teacher was provided two weeks of professional development by last year in time for the laws uh, going into effect this year. Judge Fogel, you want so, to comment? So I wanted to, I would be really remiss if I did not mention a wonderful program that the FJC and the ABA have done for 20 years now. Uh, it's a teacher institute every summer. Uh, it's about 25 high school teachers from around the country. They teach government and civics and the places that still do that. And they come for a week, they go to the Supreme Court, they meet a justice, but most of the, the uh, training actually is working on exactly what we've been talking about, the, how, you, how you do it. And really responsive to your question, uh, the last one I was involved in, which was uh, two, two summers ago, uh, we, we did the Chinese Exclusion Act cases from the 19th century, right? So we're not talking about today's debates about immigration, 
uh, and getting all hot and bothered about that. We're talking about cases that arose in the, in the late 19th century and what the Supreme Court did and what those decisions were and how they reflected on, on constitutional law. And it was really good. And the teachers kind of dug in and they talked about you know, the underlying principles and you know, there was a, just a, the, the shorthand is, there were a couple of decisions early where the court said, no, we want to let as many chi Chinese people in as possible because you know, they're working and contributing. And then some folks in California got upset that there were too many Chinese coming into California and all of a sudden the, the case law changed and there was a case later that, that, that said, no, the Chinese exclusion laws are, are constitutional. And so you got a conversation about how political climate and political forces and change can affect the development of the law. So, you, you know, that's pretty potentially controversial stuff, but doing it in a historical way and helping the teachers figure out how to talk about it was really, a, I think, a very positive experience. And that, uh, you know, full props to the ABA for supporting that and the FJC for doing it. Good. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Let's see. Is that you, Arthur? Hi, my name is Arthur Nelson. I'm a co-author of the report. Um, in looking at the problems of building public resilience, um, I think that approaching the younger generation is very convenient. There are educational institutions uh, that provide forums that we can speak to them, uh, my generation, about. Um, how do you foresee approaching older generations? Um, and it's been shown that older generations are oftentimes more susceptible to disinformation. How do we build resilience among more vulnerable populations that didn't grow up with the internet? Um, the conference of chief justices a year, uh, two years ago started what's called the community engagement project and it's actually working with leaders from uh, economically and culturally challenged uh, communities. Uh, we're partnering with the National Science Foundation actually who's done a lot of work and uh, I'm going to call it the science behind changing opinion. And, uh, and I, I think that by listening, I was going to say engaging, uh, I'll give you an example. I remember, um, I, I may have already said this, I hope I didn't. Uh, but when someone says, you know, like I, I said earlier, why do you let people get on the stand and lie? You know, our, our, our past response to that would be, oh, well, let me just explain the rules of evidence to you, rather than understanding that's where they come from. And so I'll give you an example. Do you remember uh, the police shootings in Dallas a couple of years ago? Well, in response to that, we worked with the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Hecht in Texas to convene, I wouldn't call it really a town hall meeting. It was much, it was much more intense than that but it was making sure that representatives from all the various groups who had been touched by that tragedy, I'm talking about the faith community, I'm talking about relatives of the slain police officers, I'm talking about Black Lives Matters community, we were talking about education, to come together and really sit down and listen. And then basically um, they, they developed opportunities where they would use a scenario of some sort and say, how would we solve this problem? Rather than just dealing with, with what was such a painful incident, but was used to leverage to getting them together. And so what we found is, and we, I agree with you, we can't just, yes, you're, you're, you're saying the students are an easy, low-hanging fruit opportunity, but we have to look at those people that are coming into the courts now uh, because, the, because I, I had a, um, a police officer uh, say to me one time that when you have a police shooting, if you are having to go to the Yellow Pages or the, well, nobody uses that anymore, excuse me, uh, Verizon Wireless to figure out who represents the various communities to call, you've already lost the discussion. You have to develop those relationships with those communities that you serve regularly. And it can't just be this one and done. But this opportunity in Texas gave them the, the ability to create a, a, a connection with the leaders in those communities because then they become the ambassadors. You know, if something happens, they'll say, well, wait a minute, you know, Chief Justice Hecht, when this happened in Dallas, let's call somebody uh, at the Supreme Court. You know, and, and so what we have to do is make sure you have, you're, you're prepared to deal with that. 
you know, whether it's an ombudsman type of position or someone you can I got an idea, so, McDonald's tray liners. <laughs> 32 years ago, I worked for Warren Burger when he chaired the Commission on the Bicentennial of the United States Constitution. We were struggling with the same thing. We knew we could get to kids, and, and we started a number of kids' educational programs. How do you get to the adults? You have to meet them where they live. McDonald's printed up tens of millions of dollars of tray liners talking about the precepts behind the Constitution of the United States. We had some fun selling that to Chief Justice Berger, <laughs> yeah. but by golly, millions and millions of Americans got an impression on a message of the Constitution. Oversimplification, yeah. but there's an idea in there. So we have a crisis, and you're all suggesting it could be an opportunity, and I hope it is. Um, let me, because I think time is running out on us, give each of you a chance to kind of make a quick sum up comment, and I'll start with you, Jeff. Again, I'd like to thank the CSIS for this, this program, and I think it helps to highlight the importance of this issue and the threat to the judiciary. Uh, I think it's really, uh, let's say, truism, but it, it needs to be said that I think that we have the strongest and um, most admirable judiciary in the world. We get a fair number of foreign visitors uh, to the court. Uh, we had the Chief Justice from uh, a major South American country visiting with our Chief Justice on Monday. A and he made the point that uh, people talk about America being a technological giant, but still its greatest contribution from his perspective is the rule of law and the example it sets for uh, professional jurists around the world. And we ought not to lose sight of that. Great. Mary? I guess I'll just give a quote from Bill Robinson, uh, well-loved past president of the American Bar Association. No courts, no justice, no freedom. The judiciary and the legal community have been the best allies the civic education community has been blessed to have. And I think it's because, to quote Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, you all truly get that knowledge of our system of government, our rights and responsibilities as citizens, it's not passed down through the gene pool. It must be taught, and we've got a lot of work ahead. So a judge really ought to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is, to me, this is a very difficult problem because on one hand, I think it's one of the professional values of an ethical judge is that you are self-critical, you're self-examining, you're humble. Humility is very elusive for judges, you know, because of all the deference that we get. You know, it's, it's really tough, but it's actually very important. So we have to be able to keep looking at what we don't do well. You know, when we don't have the confidence of communities of color, when we, when we don't make fair decisions because we're not really paying attention to our own inner biases. I mean, that kind of stuff is really important. And at the same time, we need to be really proud of our system. And we need to be advocates for our system. So you have to pull those two things off at the same time, but I think that's, that's our mission. And I think that traces right back to yeah. Suzanne, your yeah. opening comments, and I want to thank you for your leadership yeah. and John Hamry again for seeing that this is a really broad problem and one that we must engage in this fashion. What better for Law Day? Thank you. My pleasure. Same here. Thank you. Yeah.
got to turn it on. Oh, much better. Okay. Uh, you didn't miss anything. Um, anyway, uh, what I'm going to try to do is just step back a little bit, look at the issue, and talk a little bit about calibrating solutions. Um, I'll talk mainly about the Russians, but I don't want to leave the impression that only the Russians are engaged in disinformation. Uh, they are the most visible, they're the noisiest, but other countries also have engaged in targeted operations of this kind. As, as uh, the, was said in the first panel, this is not new. If you go back to the common turn, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, it was always part of the idea of what was then the Soviet Union to export the ideology and to be disruptive in a wide variety of settings. I remember in the 60s, which was a very disordered time with assassinations, riots, a war, um, and all kinds of disturbances, there were what they called agent provocateur who got in there, tried to amplify the violence, try to make things uh, even rougher and more disordered than they were. But the challenge they had was the tools were not particularly um, well suited for that kind of an effort. We had a limited number of news media outlets. Yes, you could sell Pravda in the United States, but who was going to buy it? Um, so they were uh, somewhat limited in the tools. Uh, this has obviously changed through two phenomena. First of all, the proliferation of cable television, talk radio, and other uh, news media outlets, which now become much more focused on individual niches. And then, of course, uh, the advent of social media and other online communications platforms. This creates many, many more outlets and really no centralized or concentrated curation of the content. Now, the reality is that even this most recent iteration of information operations has been going on in Europe at least for the last 10 or 15 years. We've only really paid attention here since 2016. But I remember being in Central Europe um, at a think tank uh, about 10 years ago after I'd left government and being um, read into the results of a Pew study in Germany about people's favorable and unfavorable attitudes to the US and Russia. And to my surprise, both countries were relatively equal in terms of favorable, unfavorable in the eyes of the Germans being polled. And I said to the folks I was talking to, how can this be? Russia occupied Germany for decades. How can they be viewed as roughly same favorability as the United States. And the answer I got is, this is disinformation. It is control of conventional media. It's control of social media. It is investing in certain businesses. It is sending clergymen over to advocate positions. And it had real results. Now, I want to make two observations <clears throat> about this to really put this in context. First of all, the Russians are doing this because um, in their view of the world, they have a legitimate grievance against the West. Um, they believe we are trying to upset their system of government by promoting democracy or promoting what they would consider our version of democracy. Um, if you've ever gone to the Munich Security Conference, as I know a number of you have, and you've heard Sergei Lavrov give the official Russian view of history since, let's say, 1950, it bears no relationship to what you remember having lived through it. Uh, but uh, in, in, a, in a relatively recent uh, encounter with a number of Russians in one of these track two diplomacy um, events, I was a little surprised to come to the realization this wasn't just rhetoric that was being said, but it was actually something that even people who described themselves as pro-American believed. So, you know, the kind of wink, wink I was thinking I would get over after they had a couple of vodkas, I didn't get that. It, I got a, a real sincere expression that this is their view of the world. It may be a little um, paranoid, but it is nevertheless deeply held, and that's important to know. The second uh, element of this um, was I was given a book uh, published in English, but it was a, from a Russian publisher called Cyber War, The Russian View. And if you read that, you realize when we talk about cybersecurity and cyber warfare, we're talking past the Russians. We're talking about efforts to disrupt 
the integrity and availability uh, of information and data being transmitted over the internet. That is part of what the Russians are talking about, but they're also talking about information they don't want to have transmitted because they don't like the content. And um, their view again is that when we're out talking about democracy or encouraging people to think about the rule of law, that is actually uh, uh, weaponizing the internet. And so that's part of what I think in, in my understanding is motivating what the Russians are currently doing. We've talked mainly about it in the context of elections, but this is a deeper strategy. It's a strategy meant in undermining the cohesiveness of societies and the relationship among allies that I think the Russians view strategically as an obstacle to their effort to control what they call the near abroad, the area uh, uh, around them, and also which they view as a geopolitical strength that they would like to water down. And a great example of, of watching how this plays out is um, after the Europeans began to invite migrants from Syria and other parts of the Middle East to come in, and there was perhaps an unanticipated spike in the number of people seeking asylum, uh, the Russians took advantage of fear and concern using social media to amplify it. And there's the famous case of Lisa, a young girl who apparently stayed out late. Uh, when she came back home, she lied to her parents about having been kidnapped by some you know, dark complexion men. Very quickly, she you know, admitted it was a fabricated story, but the Russians drove that story over social media uh, for an extended period of time because what they wanted to do was undermine the relationships among the countries in, in the EU, which had differing opinions about migration, and the confidence of the citizens in their governments. So it's not a surprise to me that in addition to using media tools to affect elections, um, they're actually using the tools to undermine faith in all institutions. Uh, and whether that is taking opposing sides of divisive social issues and encouraging people to actually go out physically and confront each other, um, or whether it's attacking the rule of law in the courts, I think this is to be expected, and I have no reason to believe it is not going to continue. So how do, we, how do we deal with this issue? Well, here I, I want to step back and, and say something which I think is very important. Um, we do need to respond to the abuses that we've seen, particularly in social media. But we have to be careful not to overreact because we don't want to become our own worst enemies. And when you're dealing with the issue of speech, um, you easily start to get into areas where the cure can be as bad, if not worse, than the disease. And so a lot of what I've tried to be thinking about in the last year or so since we've been encountering this issue is how do we really break down the various elements of this social media campaign and think about what the right response is to each of them. So when I look at um, what we've seen, and I, and I think the you know, Mueller report, which is now out, uh, gives some really good examples of this, and you've read others about what the Russians have done. Um, there are really four dimensions other than the content of speech that are features of what is driving this effort with some considerable degree of success. And I, I begin by stepping back and saying, what is the feature of the internet that is, in my mind, really distinctive? Uh, and to me, it goes to the issue of trust. You know, when we meet people in the real world, we can judge the degree of trust we ought to accord them, not only by hearing what they say, but by watching their body language, looking at how they're dressed and comparing that to what they're saying, uh, considering a whole lot of collateral things that let us form a judgment whether someone is trustworthy or not. But you don't get that on the internet. And one of my favorite cartoons is the old New York cartoon going back probably about 20 years maybe 15 years, shows two dogs in front of a personal computer, and one dog says to the other, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that is the fundamental challenge with the internet. How do you establish trust? So how do people establish trust? Well, one way they do it is, do they know the person that they're communicating with? 
because if they do know the person, then if they trust that person, they trust the communication. Another is um, an attentiveness to what some people call the wisdom of crowds. If a particular message or story appears to be validated by a lot of people adopting it, liking it, and retweeting it, that gets a certain credibility because there's this wisdom of crowds. Um, and finally, there is the natural interest and inclination to look at something provocative. Um, I mean, this is not a new story. Again, if you go back 30 or 40 years in the, in the television news business, there was the expression, if it bleeds, it leads. People do get attracted to something startling or unusual. So how do these three features, as they affect our interaction with the internet, how do they play into the hands of a Russian disinformation strategy? Well, first is impersonation. Much of what the Russians have done is pretend to be your friend, pretend to be Americans or citizens of whatever country they're dealing with, um, or otherwise attempt to masquerade as someone who is inherently reliable. And so impersonation is one element or one dimension of what makes the Russians uh, able to carry out some of these operations that I think is something we can respond to. I don't think there's a First Amendment right to impersonate other people on the internet or to pretend to be someone you're not. And so one area I think we can pretty clearly encourage platforms to, to do is to um, unmask people who impersonate, to shut down accounts involving phony people, uh, and certainly in the case of campaigns, and we have some legislation proposing this, suggesting that um, people who contribute or otherwise are part of a campaign effort have to identify themselves. And of course, foreign uh, elements may not be permitted to do so at all. The second element is amplification, um, which is again, uh, trying to pretend you've got the wisdom of crowds. This is usually done by using either automated systems of botnets or trolls who are sitting somewhere in St. Petersburg being told to click and click and click and tweet and retweet again and again on certain stories. These may be stories that they generate themselves or they may be stories generated by real people, even Americans, but that are, are um, furthering the goal of creating dissension and dissatisfaction. And here again, I think particularly when you detect these automated or concerted programs, I don't see much First Amendment argument in favor of protecting the right of people to manipulate search engines by feeding false information as to whether people really like something or not. So that's a second area where I do think uh, we ought to be paying some attention to whether we can unmask these using algorithms and artificial intelligence and shut them down or at least correct for the misleading element of popularity by discounting it when you're not dealing with natural people who are genuine. The third element which I mentioned is the uh, natural tendency to capture your attention by doing something outrageous or something that's provocative. And here what the, the tool that has been exploited is a commercial feature of the internet, which is the more times you look at stories, the more the advertising rates go up and the more money the platform makes. So what you do is you create algorithms that if you look for a certain kind of story, will then recommend other stories or other um, uh, sites you can visit that will um, pique your interest given what you've already looked for. We've seen this, by the way, it's been used uh, for terrorist recruiting as well because what's happened, and I think this is inadvertent, is when people ask a question about you know, a certain type of ideological individual, they may be fed stories that lure them further and further into extremes. This ability to exploit the commercial algorithm to drive people further and further down the rabbit hole is, re is really a, a feature we've seen not only with terrorist recruiting, but can be used by the Russians as well. And I think there's actually a proposed piece of legislation now called the Algorithm Accountability Act that proposes that there be some requirements 
on the part of platforms that they monitor their algorithms, that they correct them for errors, um, and that they also allow for a certain amount of correction or counteraction. And here again, I don't know that these algorithms have First Amendment value, uh, but I do know they have real impact in terms of what we've seen with disinformation. Finally, a fourth element is what we have seen in some cases, which the use is the use of cyber attacks to steal information and then disseminate it in what is sometimes called doxing. And we saw that in 2016. Um, here again, that's illegal. And certainly uh, anyone who hacks into a database for purposes of stealing is going to wind up having committed a crime. But one challenge is what do you do when someone makes use of this? When Julian Assange or somebody else agrees to give you or otherwise publicize information, is that something that ought to be exploited by campaigns? And one of the things I've done the last couple of days is I have um, been working um, as co-chair of a transatlantic commission on election integrity. My other co-chair is Anders Rasmussen, the former head of NATO, and we've got about a dozen commissioners, some European, some from North America. And one of the things we've promoted is a uh, pledge uh, on the part of people for election integrity, to have candidates agree that their campaigns will not knowingly use false fabricated information, um, uh, uh, technologically manipulated videos that are untrue, or otherwise do thi or, or use stolen data that was hacked. These things may not all be against the law, but they're certainly ethically questionable. And this pledge has now been signed by 150 candidates for the European Parliament. I was in Canada uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, all three of the major parties have signed up to this, and we're now talking to a number of people in the US. So there are things we can do, even ourselves, as a self-regulatory matter to protect against this. Finally, I would say this. Um, I do think when it comes to content, we have to be careful. The truth is a lot of the content which has been propagated and is most disturbing doesn't necessarily originate from overseas. Uh, we've got enough people in this country with strange ideas that when their ideas are detected, uh, they can be propagated and made viral. But we don't yet believe, with some narrow exceptions, that the First Amendment allows us to regulate speech simply because it's wrong or misguided or even annoying. And so I think we need to be careful, again, not to undercut those basic principles simply because we are frustrated and alarmed by some of what we see. Um, I think education is critical. And there's no question that it ought to be done uh, in the schools. But I think, as somebody said uh, a little bit ago, which I was surprised to learn, because we're always you know, saying it's the millennials we have to educate and the, and the Generation Z. Actually, the young folks generally understand more about this than some of the folks who are in my generation, the baby boomers, because I've been informed that a lot of the most avid retweeting and republication of some of these crazy ideas comes from people who are older, who are not used to the fact that just because it appeared on the internet doesn't mean it's true. So we got to do a little bit of adult education, or dare I say, even senior education as well. And finally, a subject outside the scope of my, of my talk, but something that I do think we have to think about is, what is our deterrent strategy against nation states that weaponize the internet to interfere with our social fabric, our legal system, and our elect electoral system. Thus far, we've done some things. We've indicted people. Uh, I think it's unlikely they're going to see a, a, a US courtroom, although occasionally a foreign actor travels and unwittingly winds up stepping into a country with extradition with the US, and they get arrested and sent back. Um, but I still think it sends a good message. I think sanctions, which we've I initiated, uh, and expulsions can send a good message. The harder question is, um, at some point do we consider whether we actually take 
efforts in cyberspace to mitigate, blunt, or otherwise repel these attacks. Um, and that gets to the issue of deterrence, which is very challenging, uh, both from the standpoint of the laws that apply, and also from the standpoint of how do we avoid escalating to a very dangerous place. But I will leave you with this thought. If at some point we get to the stage that there is significant interference with elections, for example, or the courts. Imagine, for example, hacking into court databases and releasing confidential information. Or imagine doing things on the eve of an election uh, with what they call so-called deep fake videos that totally fabricate a candidate making outrageous statements that are, which are wholly untrue and the person never said. Imagine efforts to hack into a database and make it hard from people, for people from certain communities to vote because of the understanding that, that will tip the balance. At that point, we're dealing with a fundamental attack on our institutions and what our response is and our ability to deter, deter that will become an important part of this mandate that uh, Benjamin Franklin said after the Constitution was framed, which is it's a republic if you can keep it. So thanks very much to everybody for hosting this, and let's keep paying attention.